Cinderella, and you are watching Blister, where the action's big and my ego is even bigger. Lock the doors and hide the children, because we have got another M-rated episode of your favorite action show. Now, we're going to catch up with all of your favorite dinosaur hunters this side of Turok in Dino Crisis 3. We'll also get up close and cozy with the hunter in two separate adventures, and try our hand at some covert ops with an elite band of soldiers in Rainbow Six Three Raven Shield. Then we'll bring it on home with a pair of games that will simultaneously scare the daylights and nightlights out of you. Clock Tower 3 and X-Files Resist or Serve. Trust no one except Bill Sindelar. I'm sorry. Anyway, let's get this party started with a game that combines two of my favorite things, Belgium and comic books. Belgium offers Jean Man Arms. Graphic novel 13 has been brought to the wonderful world of video games. This may not be the first game based on a graphic novel, but it is the first graphic novel come to life that takes onomatopoeia to a new level. So let's hit it. Boom, bam, pow, smack, uh. Bang, bang, shoot him up, the conspiracy never ends. You can't think of stopping when the chasing never ends. 13 is a first-person shooter. 13 could be fun. If you're into cell-shaded mysteries, 13 could be the one. You embody uh, a man, 13, uh, which, who wakes up uh, on a beach and he has no memories of his past. The only clues he has is a tattoo on his shoulder, the 13 tattoo, and a key for a deposit box. The president has been assassinated. And it turns out that you've actually been uh, accused of the president's assassination. You have a number of people after you who want to kill you. Um, some of them undercover, some of them part of the government, and some of them possibly part of both. You don't know. There's a lot of double-crossing, betrayal, a lot of distrust. It's a really challenge for him is to recover his identity, to recover his past, and to recover his honor, because he really wants to know if he really shot the president or not. So it's a big suspense for, for the player because you never know on which side you are. If this sounds like Matt Damon's Born Identity plot, well, I never saw it, but the story is based on a very popular French comic book called, what else, 13. And the kind people at Ubisoft have tried to make 13 as comic booky as possible. With the comic book style, it's really easy for us to uh, highlight some elements to be really more violent without being gore. We uh, adapt all the characters and uh, backgrounds into comic books, so we use the cell shading techniques uh, to feel like a cartoon, not like a cartoon, like a Zelda game, but really like a, a comic book, a violent comic book. And we uh, also use all the techniques with uh, pop-ups and windows appearing uh, each time uh, during the, the game. So for example, if you use your crossbow to shoot someone, you shoot it and, and, and suddenly you've got pop, 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 three pop-ups showing the, the, the error entering into the head uh, of the enemies. Poor 13. As he tries to uncover the layers and layers of mystery, the flashbacks will appear quicker than you can say electric Kool-Aid acid test. <laughs> uh, you can see an object or a place, and suddenly you recover a part of, of your past. So you get a, a wonderful effect, and you see the world level in black and white, and this is a flashback and you are still in, uh, you can still play it. It's a scripted event, so you are playing in your past. This is really great. There are two ways to go through this game. Guns blasting in a blaze of glory or sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Both have their place. You can either go through the front doors and fire away like a young Antonio Banderas or you can find alternative means for a silent approach like an old Antonio Banderas. In addition to your basic FPS weapons like guns and hand grenades, you'll be able to use any item you come across as a weapon. A shard of glass? Use it! A chair? Go stone cold on your enemies. And here's something even Bruce Willis can get behind. A feature called Sixth Sense. Sort of your own personal spider sense. You'll know whenever an enemy is coming down a hallway or sneaking up behind you by the tap 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 visual that pops up. I wish that existed in real life. Or does it? 
13 is the FPS shooter of this fall. It's got style, it's got multiplayer, um, it's got such a great story that's going to really drive gamers in to have a wonderful gaming experience. 13 will be available on all systems. It's 13, an FPS game. 13, with a cell shaded frame. 13, what is his name? He's got to get out of this place. He'll go running to solve this case. Oh, yeah. 13 looks awesome, but it serves a much higher purpose than just entertaining us. It also teaches us that there is more to Belgium than Jean-Claude Van Damme. I mean, not much more, but you know, it's, but there's much more. And speaking of actors that you'd like to see jettisoned into outer space, let's head to the cosmos for a look at Dino Crisis 3. That's right, we are headed to outer space with the dinosaur game. <laughs> Think of the third game in the survival horror series as a hybrid of Jurassic Park and Alien, but Sigourney Weaver ain't gonna save you this time. Put away your books on paleontology and archaeology, ditch those lectures on evolutionary theory and natural science, and definitely get rid of those romance novels. For it is I who have discovered the truth about the sudden disappearance of dinosaurs. It wasn't a giant rock from outer space slamming into the earth that made the dinosaurs go the way of the dodo. It was space travel. The dinos simply learned how to fly. Well, it was either that or they just couldn't sit through the second and third Jurassic Park movies. Enter Patrick. He and his team are sent out into space in the year 2548 to investigate an enormous ship that has appeared out of nowhere. Of course, things go foobar for Patrick, and he's left alone on the ship along with hundreds, nay, thousands of dinosaurs. Where did this ship come from? What happened to the original crew? And why, for the love of Pete, are the dinosaurs roaming the quiet countryside? We haven't given away too much for the storyline yet uh, with Dino Crisis 3, but I can tell you the setting is in space. Thank you. And it's a gigantic ship that can transform, and the environments on this ship are unbelievable. They're the biggest environments I've ever seen. All the dinosaurs on the ship are mutated, and there's quite a decent variety of them. The first two games for the PlayStation were more like Capcom's Resident Evil series, with the nasty dinos taking the place of zombies. This Xbox-exclusive Dino 3 Quill is not only in full 3D, but it also boasts a few other improvements, namely, faster action. Patrick has a healthy supply of miniature robot wasps that attack the dinosaurs, an auto-targeting system, a first-person mode, and a jetpack. You can use your jetpack to uh, not only get to higher places, but you can zip across the uh, screen and get away from the dino, turn around, uh, and blast them. Personally, I like the spaceship flying dinosaur theory the best. It doesn't take much of an imagination to tell people that the dinosaurs are extinct because of a rogue asteroid, but a couple of dinosaurs named Maverick and Goose? <laughs> I'm so there. Visually, I guarantee no one will be disappointed. It is, it is you know, one of the most impressive games I've seen, period. Those are brave words, my friend. Brave words. Dino Crisis 3 is no routine expedition, and you won't find Marshall, Will, or Holly on this adventure, but you can conceivably run into some slea stacks. Okay, now I know some of you probably need to go Google slea stacks, so I'll give you a chance to go log in. But when you get back, we'll continue our M-rated quest for gaming perfection as we take a look at hunters, both Redeemer and Wayward. Plus, we'll head behind enemy lines with Tom Clancy and his ragtag Rainbow Six Squad in Raven Shield. That's coming up only here on Blister. Here's what's happening on Pulse. Two years ago, Nintendo cut its ties with Rare, the developer behind Donkey Kong Country. Now there's a rumor that Microsoft-owned Rare is developing for the DS. Plus, nobody does immersive RPGs better than Square Enix, and they were looking to prove it at this year's E3. We'll give you a glimpse of what they had on the show floor. That's what's coming up this week. For all the news in the world of games, make sure to watch what you play right here on Pulse. Euphoria, the award show for gamers, is starting soon. Welcome back to Blister. I'm Bill Sindelar. I'm sure my peeps, when we were playing the World of Darkness pen and paper RPGs way back in the day, they never thought that they would see that universe come to life on the Xbox, and yet it did, in the form of Hunter the Reckoning. And now it's back with both Redeemer and Wayward. Let's head to Ashcroft for a session of vampire slaying, and who knows, maybe we'll do some demon slaying and zombie killing while we're at it. Hmm? As Jean-Claude Van Damme taught us in Double Impact, 
Two is always better than one. That's why Hunter the Reckoning is coming at us with two sequels at once. Hunter the Reckoning Wayward for the PS2 and Hunter the Reckoning Redeemer for the Xbox. Both games are multiplayer 3D actioners that teach us that the best way to conquer evil forces is to blow them to pieces. Hunter the Reckoning Wayward for the PS2 takes place in the quiet town Ashcroft two years after the first game. The four original hunters are summoned back to take care of a resurgence of evil forces and save the innocent Ashcroftians. But come on, you know the deal with fighting these evil forces. They bring the evil boojums, and you bring the melee. It's hunt or be hunted with Wayward's cast of possessed creatures. Take advantage of the magic edges to boost your fighting potential. And when you've got a possessed bat on his last legs, unload. The gameplay in Wayward is centered on a hub where each mission begins and ends. Every pit stop provides an opportunity to choose which level to play next, switch between four playable characters, and load up on weapons of evil destruction, including swords, a crossbow, and a submachine gun. All of this should help you drive the evil out of Ashcroft. And you better because the Xbox sequel Redeemer is on its way. Hunter the Reckoning Redeemer for the Xbox brings us back to the town of Ashcroft a decade later. This time around, an evil corporation has used its consumer products to infect the residents of Ashcroft and turn them into zombies. Again. The good thing is that there's a team of hunters out there to stop them. The great thing about this is that one of the hunters is an 18-year-old hottie named Kaylee. She appeared in the original game as a little girl whose teddy bear became possessed and mauled her parents. And now, she's back to get revenge. All seven playable characters can wield a sword at super speed, and each character also has five magic lifts that give them superpowers. To raise the intensity even further, try the multiplayer co-op mode. But be prepared, as you add players, the AI compensates, keeping the difficulty high and tight. Redeemer has plenty of secrets to uncover as you clean up the town of Ashcroft, again. Killing the monsters will credit you with monster cards, which you'll be able to use to unlock the 20 playable monsters. Both Wayward and Redeemer will release their evil on the town of Ashcroft again this fall. So get the heck out of Ashcroft, people. Run! Between Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and the Hunter series, we now know exactly what to do when the undead rise from the grave. Play video games. <laughs> It's hard to prepare for an undead invasion, but there is no such thing as being too prepared when it comes to being part of an elite military squad. And that's exactly where you find yourself in Rainbow Six Three Raven Shield, Tom Clancy's latest, and dare we say, greatest game. Terrorism is at an all-time high, and it seems that only the covert ops team known as Raven Shield can put the world back in balance. In 1998, author Tom Clancy brought to the world of video games a crack commando anti-terrorist unit. Today, the unit survives battling terrorism wherever it can. If you have a problem with terrorists, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire Rainbow Six Three Raven Shield. The premise of the game is that you're an elite anti-terrorist unit from all around the world. You've got operatives from everywhere, and you basically stop terrorists from doing evil things. Open door. Yes, sir. Rainbow Six Squad is great at what they do. Why? Because they use stealth. Behind any door could lie an eager terrorist ready to send you to your final resting place. And I don't mean Tallahassee. The squads plan out their operations. They use teamwork. They use intelligence. They know it's not always the best idea to barge in willy-nilly with guns blazing. Although sometimes it ain't such a bad idea. When the Rainbow Six team is on the move, they'll be well stocked with weaponry. There's no shortage of military hardware with this elite fighting unit. We've tweaked the weapons out. Uh, basically, before they had about 30 weapons, and they had different varieties of those weapons that gave you about 60 or 70 weapons total. But what we did was we pulled out 57 weapons, the same ones that were before, and we added about 10 more. And then we let you customize the weapon. If you want to put a scope on it, you can. If you want to put a high-capacity magazine or a sound suppressor, or if you want to put a thermal attachment on your sniper rifle, you can. And it's a way of letting players customize the way they play the game. Ah, there's nothing more personally satisfying to any anti-terrorist team than using the flashbang grenade. Obviously, the Rainbow Six Squad has a leader, one that calls the shots. That person could be you. You'll be responsible for the lives of your AI team, and your AI team could save your life. They'll provide you with safe cover and follow your commands to the letter. Open, smoke, and clear. Right away, sir. 
But the enemy AI won't follow your commands to the letter. They want you dead. They want your family dead. They want your house burned to the ground. Which is all the more reason for the Rainbow Six Squad to use care and covertness to reach their objectives. This way, captives will be easier to come by. There's no area of the world that Rainbow Six Squad is afraid of. They'll travel from Switzerland to London to South America and everywhere in between. No weather change or time of day will stop the Rainbow Six Squad. The only thing that stops them is your imagination. By incorporating the new Unreal Engine into the action, Rainbow Six 3 Raven Shield could be the best game of the series. The locations are realistic and the ragdoll physics incorporated never gets old. Tom Clancy must be very proud. I know I am. Flashbang, out! There's nothing better than a flashbang to brighten your day. <laughs> it's a flashbang. All right, you know what? I'm going to go stand in the corner and think about what I just said. But that doesn't mean that you should go anywhere, because after the break, we're switching from counter-terror to murderous madman as we rock around the clock tower three. And is the truth out there? We'll find out in X-Files, Resist or Serve. That's coming up only on Blister. Welcome back to Blister, I'm David Duchovny. Capcom's new game, Clock Tower 3, sounds like my life story. You play a teenage girl sent away to boarding school. As a young Alyssa Hamilton, your only goal is survival. But unlike Capcom's other survival horror games, you only have a cache of impressive weapons at your disposal. Instead, you'll have to rely on your wits and holy water to get out of harm's way. And did I mention the ghost that you'll meet along the way? Ghost, I'm in the studio. and I'm gonna tell you a story about my family. But first, let's go into a dreary medieval castle where serial killers go to find future victims. We'll be safe there. My sweet Alyssa, <laughs> I've been waiting so long for this moment. Get away from me! Come on, Alyssa, you gotta be more careful because danger looms around every corner in Clock Tower 3. This edition of the survival horror franchise centers on Alyssa, a 15-year-old British girl with a heart of gold and a serious knack for finding her way into trouble. Against her mother's advice, Alyssa returns to her family's mansion in London to celebrate her 15th birthday. But it turns out her friends are otherwise occupied. <laughs> Alyssa's London is filled with disturbingly realistic violence and an intensely eerie soundtrack. So, naturally, Alyssa takes cover in safe, comforting places like an abandoned theater and dark alleys, places where she can be sure to never run into, oh no, serial killers! Alyssa! Luckily, Clock Tower 3 loads Alyssa up with massive artillery. Alyssa packs three splashes of holy water that can momentarily paralyze attackers, and, well, that's it. Besides that, she has all the other options 15-year-old girls have in fighting serial killers. Nothing. Sometimes you run, sometimes you hide, sometimes you're scared. But the key to Clock Tower 3 is keeping your cool while you're running and hiding. When Alyssa gets panicked, she gets dizzy and loses her mobility. And worst of all, it starts to bother her when she gets bludgeoned with a sledgehammer. Ouch! Many hammer hurts. The best way to keep Alyssa from becoming panicked is to stay away from any action. Of course, serial killers and undead spirits seek out little girls, so you have to run away, crouch, and hide. The most reliable hiding places are behind translucent curtains. No joke. If you can't find such great camouflage, try downing a swig of lavender water, which will settle the panic meter, keeping Alyssa in control. Mmm, lavender water. It's calming like a candlelight bubble bath on a Sunday afternoon until the serial killers return.
Speaking of alone time, Alyssa spends her solving puzzles to advance the story. In general, they're fairly simple alphanumeric riddles that crack safes and open doors. They may not be too challenging, but at least it's a good reason to finally go out and learn to read. Better than unlocking the safes is unlocking the cutscenes, which are mini slasher movies of the highest quality. <laughs> Keep on running from the serial killers. And remember, crouching and throwing holy water isn't just for the Pope anymore, it's for Clock Tower 3. The first two games in the Clock Tower series were point-and-click adventures and acquired taste to be kind, so it's great to see the adventure move in an action-oriented direction. Now, if there's one thing that I've learned from watching TV is that there's nothing better than watching TV. I've also learned, trust no one. At least that's what Fox Mulder told me. Call the Lone Gunman. X-Files resists or serve is coming to council. So let's check in with TV's greatest pair of FBI agents and see what wacky hijinks that they've gotten themselves into this time. The truth is right here. Those fingers in my hair, that's like come hither stare. X-File fans, I want you to know that the truth is that I miss that dry David Duchovny wit and that sly Gillian Anderson grin. But my prayers for a comeback have been answered in the form of the X-Files resist or serve. And this time, the truth, you can just shove it up your ass. Thank you. Scripted by Tom Schnoz, a writer on the last two seasons of the series, the game finds Mulder and Scully investigating, here's a shocker, a mystery. Ooh, a paranormal mystery, if you will. Ooh. This is an early version of the game, but as you can see, Mulder and Scully have a slight zombie problem. Their inquisitive ways will set the dynamic duo out on the path of an inhuman killer in Red Falls, Colorado, all the way to Siberia, Russia. Upon their arrival in the snowy wasteland, they will no doubt be confronted by aliens, UFOs, and the ubiquitous black oil, that none too subtle commentary on the cause of troubles in our own world. Resist or Serve is styled after the survival horror hits Resident Evil and Silent Hill, but sports that extra level of paranormal paranoia that only Chris Carter can give it. Are you telling me we're driving into a witch hunt, Alden? If you want to catch witches, you have to go on a witch hunt, Scully. Both Anderson and Duchovny recorded hours of dialogue, along with the actors behind the voices of the cigarette-smoking man, Skinner, and the ever-present lone gunman. Playing the game will set you out on two different paths. If you choose Mulder, the game will involve more combat elements. As Scully, you will not only be hot, but you will have to solve more puzzles and use your ND skills to perform autopsies on zombies. The two characters will run into each other throughout the story, and after you finish the game as one character, you'll be able to go back and play as the other. Standard FBI weaponry will be available, as well as the ability to combine items in your inventory to create a new tool or weapon. To help set up the grim and creepy mood that the TV series is so famous for, the show's score and music will be used, as well as FMV scenes from several episodes. Do you believe in UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, and the moon landings? If so, you're ready for The X-Files. Resist or serve. Come on, Scully, you know the words. Sing with me. If you're a hardcore fan of the TV series, then you'll realize that Resist or Serve is actually set during the seventh season of the show. Or is it? Now, are you like Mulder and me? Do you believe in aliens? Were moon landings fate? Are my tight shirts reverse engineered from alien technology? What do you believe? Well, log on to our message boards at g4tv.com slash blister and let me know. Well, that's all the time we've got for this edition of Blister. I'm Bill Sindelar. We'll see you next time. Now, get on out of here. Bye, everybody. See you later. I'll never do that again. Don't even email me. I know, okay? I'm with you. Uh -huh. Log on to our message boards at g4tv.com. Com. Com. Aliens have taken over my voice. I can't speak. Just log on to the message boards and get on out of here. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway. G4, TV for Gamers, and Tech TV are connecting to form the only network taking digital entertainment to the next level. Sound fun? I love video games. Plugged in to every aspect of games, gear, gadgets, and gigabytes. That was unexpected, right? Okay. Uh, You're watching G4 Tech TV. G4 Tech TV.
Stay connected. Tune in for a sneak peek of Tech TV all week at 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. For more information, go to g4techtv.com. Clive Gallagher. He used to call me Lara Beanstalk. I'd run home crying and he'd just laugh. Sure he's not laughing now? No. No, no, he'd just follow me around and look at my bottom. Are men only interested in you because of your body? No. I'm rich too, darling. G4. Kirby Air Ride. Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. And in Versus, it's Metal Arms glitching the system against Kaya, the Dark Lineage. Talk about Looney Tunes back in action. This is for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. It's distributed by Electronic Arts. Now, what'd you think of this one? Boy, I said, boy, this game is about as dull as a bowling ball. Well, it's not quite that dull. No, I'm just kidding. But it's approaching that level of dullness. Share this imitation. All right. Suffering suck a Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's that's some good work. The character voices are absolutely phenomenal in this game. I mean, they really spent the time and energy and creative forces into really injecting the Warner Brothers characters into this experience, and I, I thought that was really well done. I, I commend them for that. They have the granny that, you know, she wants you to find Tweety, and then Sylvester's chasing Tweety, and you know, a lot of cool, cool like, all the characters. I, I like Elmer Fudd and the Tasmanian Devil. They didn't just, you know, slap a license on a 3D game and throw it out oh, there. I wouldn't go that far. I think there's a lot of problems with the gameplay, but I did really like the sense of humor. And the good news is that the characters are there. They're voiced by a lot of the same actors that you'd find in the in the cartoons. Got some really funny quips. They kind of make fun of themselves being in a video game. Yeah, I like that. Welcome to the world famous Louvre Museum. The what for? The Louvre. You can play as either Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck. With Bugs, you can double jump and you can uh, uh, hit everything with a hammer, and you can also burrow underneath the ground. That's, burrow in the ground. That's a great. cool effect. I yeah. like that. And then Daffy Duck, you can sort of hover jump for a little bit. He, he flaps his wings like crazy. Yeah, and he has a frying pan that he hits everybody with. It's kind of like a cooperative, like one player experience in that you know you can play Bugs and you hit a button and then you bring in Daffy and then you can, Daffy can help do stuff and sometimes you need to have two characters on screen. The goal is to, well, part of the goal is to collect spinning coins yes. and break wooden crates. That's the theme. Have we not we've, progressed? We've never done anything like that before, have we? In video games, never. Nah. There's a ton of little hidden extras that you can unlock, like actual clips from cartoons and trailers. There's the, the whole movie trailer, because this is all you know, loosely based off of the uh, well, back in action not at all, feature actually. film. Yeah, there's no Brendan there's, Fraser. There's no, there's there's no, no. Or Jenna Elfman or Steve Martin. I found that there was tons of problems though with the camera. I mean, well, that's the worst part of the game. Every time you, you basically get off the ground, you're asking for trouble because the camera just freaks out and like hides behind a tree or just like tries to get away from your character any chance it can get. Overall, it, it's definitely above average. You well, know? you know, I had problems with Daffy's control. I mean, we, we spent a long time just trying to find, the, you know, land on a ledge. But you're right, it still has some fun in it. And, you know, I know that it's Looney a little Tune, different. I know what? Well, it's different. It's the same, but with different characters. What? It's just like every other platform action thing. Oh, well, Always how many other secure. platform games you got speed of Gonzales to? Yeah, he was cool. Yippee, yippee, Andre, Andre, Riva, Riva, Yippee! You know, no, I you don't. don't get that in Tomb Raider. No, you don't. I do not get that and in Tomb Raider. And maybe that's what Tomb Raider's missing. So what are you going to give Looney Tunes back in action? I'm giving it a 7. I thought it was pretty entertaining. I thought it was better than average, 5.5 .5 out of 10. On the positive side, it's really cool to see all the Looney Tunes characters used so well in a game. Good to see him back in action. <laughs> and the humor and voices in the game are extremely well done. On the negative side, this game has serious camera control problems. We had some difficulty making jumps with Daffy Duck. And even though the voice quips are great, they do get a bit repetitive. All right, now we're gonna move on to a cartoon racing game for the Nintendo GameCube. This is Kirby Air Ride. Been looking forward to this one. Illuminate us, kind sir, on why okay. you don't like Kirby Air Ride. Point number one. Right. 
you're a ball with eyes. Right. And what looks to be arms on the side, although I'm not sure. You don't like Kirby? No, I okay, hate him, all right. in fact. Point I hate number Kirby. two. I'll stick Kirby in my bum and fart him out, and that will give you a Kirby air ride. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Kirby air ride is three games in one, just like Tommy says. You get the air ride part of the game, which is basically like, you can imagine a snowboarding game mixed with wipeout. It's sort of like that. You're on hovering stars. Except not fun. And you whip through these psychedelic environments. You've got like a beanstalk world or a magma world, like a lava type world or an ice world. Magma. The other game is the City Trial, which is kind of like Kirby Air Ride's battle mode, where you have different opponents and everybody's fighting each other. And then the third game is Top Ride, which is just like Super Sprint, where you can see everybody on screen at the same time. I always talk about simplicity in games and how right. I love controls to be really simple. Right. This exemplifies simplicity and, right and here. And so basically, there's no gas or go button in the racing game. He just goes. It's like like you said, you compared it to a snowboarding game. That's right. You're just going. You're, you're just going. going. You're going no now, matter what's happening. The the big button, that, what is that, the A button? The A they button. They call that? Yep. That's for everything. It's for brakes. It's for collecting stuff. It's for even to the point where when you collect like a firing weapon, you don't even push the button to fire. No, it just starts firing. Like they, it's completely too simplistic. That's in the city trial mode. They use one button and that's it. In the two-player game, you really don't ever feel like you're racing against. I disagree. The second player. I disagree. Because you go off on all these little it's paths very and distracting. things. It's You never, you never feel like, oh, he's coming up right behind we, me. We, oh, we had a close race. One race out we, of about we, twenty. We had a close race. One about twenty. And, and I was fighting you the whole time because you don't like Kirby. I mean, you were, your mind was closed. Of on course, this I don't like Kirby. And if all I don't right. like Kirby, I'm not going to play the Kirby Air Ride game. Hey, I give you that. I understand that. Right. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be turned off by the look of this of game. But there are going to be people that are open to playing a different style of racing game. And that's what I this want game names. delivers. You want names and I numbers? I want names of these people. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. If you've got four people around the TV set and they're into Kirby, they'll have a good time. Okay, now talk and, to and me about the city ride mode, though. There's another problem. When we play two players that's at, the, that's it's the like worst the most the watered-down, twisted metal yeah, that's the worst part of you've the game. ever seen. I mean, he didn't know it. I actually put the controller down, <laughs> walked away for about five minutes, came back, and my guy's still going, and Vic thought he was doing good, and he's trying to race against me. I never even touched the controller for five minutes. The thing's sitting on it. I said, hey, Vic, you're having fun. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed Kirby Air Ride. It's definitely not an amazing, going to change your world kind of video game, but it was fun. Seven out of ten. Dumb license, dumb game, 4.5. On the positive side, there are three different racing modes in the game. There are tons of unlockable secrets to find. And the best part about the game is that it's deceptively simple. It's actually a very complex and deep racing game. On the negative side, that's one of the problems with this game is I'm not sure who this is going to appeal to. It's too hard for kids. I personally don't like Kirby, and I don't think that a lot of people out there are going to like him either. Although I love simple controls, these controls are way too simple. Stick around, we're coming right back with a review of Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. Brought to you by the United States Air Force. Cross into the blue. In the world of a professional assassin, there is no place for compassion. Hitman Contracts, in stores April 21st. Rated M for Mature. win every year. <laughs> I'm really cold. Well, not really, but I am playing SSX3, which makes me cold. Now, SSX is all about speed down the mountain and freaky moves and action adventure and stuff. Now, this game, although it has the 3D worlds, 
really doesn't have that cutting edge action and speed that you're used to in the SSX franchise. You can connect head to head of course for competition against your friends and you can also connect it to the Nintendo GameCube. It's kind of becoming like a standard among games for the Advance this year which is great. It is a nice 3D world but lots of pop-up. It almost takes your focus off playing the game sometimes. Now they also have a bunch of licensed tunes in here as well. You know you get that kind of edgy vibe going on like the original SSX. It's okay. If you're a snowboarding freak, you're going to dig it, but like I said, it's, it's okay. It really has some speed issues, which I wish could be resolved. Overall, I'm going to give it a 7. All right, we're going to talk about Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy, which is available for the Xbox. PlayStation 2 and GameCube. It's from THQ. What'd you think of this one? Now, Sphinxter. Sp uh, Sphinx. What? <laughs> Curse of the Mummy? Right. No, Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. You play as a cat like character, the Sphinx. He's like a demigod that has all kinds of really cool acrobatic abilities. You also get to play as the Mummy, who is basically an invincible character. He can't be killed. And just like Voodoo Vince, you can do things like set him on fire or electrocute him and use him to solve the puzzles that he gets into within the game. But the thing is, right. is that there's no, no VO right. voiceovers for those of you in the know right. in the game at all. That's correct. So Interesting decision there. Awesome <laughs> interesting decision, I'll say. <laughs> During the cinematics, their lips are moving. See, that's the crime. But nothing is coming out. That's the real problem. Kind of like what I wish would happen with you sometimes. Right, I got you. The gameplay is actually, it's a mix of Zelda with all of the action RPG sort of discussions that you have throughout the game, but it also has elements of Prince of Persia, I thought, in the game. This is about, you know, a lot of really in-depth, thought-provoking puzzles. Yes. Which, as fun as they are and challenging as they are, it almost seems a bit too challenging, right. which hinders the fun value and the fun factor. One thing they could have done, yeah. which could have taken all of that away, and most games do these now, is have some kind of objective. It doesn't have to tell you exactly what you have to do, right. but give you a hint or something. That t like, what am I supposed to do next? I know. It's, I have no idea it, what I'm supposed to do. They just throw you in this world and say, figure it out. And that gets a little tedious. So I love the fact that there was such a, a difference playing with each of the two characters. The, the mummy is all puzzle solving. He doesn't have any weapons. He can't really beat on the bad guys. It's much more stealthy. And the Sphinx has got a great sword and a very cool shield. Which you eventually pick up along the right. journey. I would have liked to have seen a little more battling like in Prince of Persia. I right. think was a perfect example where they had puzzles, they had great battle action scenes. This one was a little less on the battle and action. Would have liked it to see more of that. The fighting's fun though. I mean, it's really solid. I was a little unhappy with the closeness of the camera. I, I wish that it was a little further back or that at least you could adjust it or sometimes the games you hit a button and it, and it brings it out a little bit more that's right. not a difficult thing to do in, right. in creating like a Prince game. of Persia they did that we, wish they would have done that I like this game a lot I'm gonna give it an 8.5 I'm giving it an 8 on the positive side Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy features beautiful environments that are very fun to explore the difference in the style of gameplay for the two characters is excellent and there are lots of innovative interesting puzzles to solve and cool items to collect on the negative side, none of the characters have voiceovers at all. Their lips move, but they ain't saying much. It would have been nice to see the camera view pulled back a little bit. And I really wish the objectives were a little more clearly defined. We're going to take a look at a device that allows for wireless internet connection. That's the big buzz out there. Everybody's talking about wireless internet and they're the 802.11b kind of connections and Elemental stuff like that. XYZ. You know what I'm talking about? The B or the G. I actually have no idea what you're talking All right. about, but well, go ahead, well, keep going. This device is from Nyko, and what it is, it's called the Wireless Net Extender, and it allows you to create a wireless connection without having to buy a wireless router. It works with your regular cable connection and your regular ethernet connection on your device and you set up two wireless pods, one at each end, 
and they send the signals back and forth to each other. You don't have to get a special card for your PC. You don't have to get a special new modem or router or anything like that. So what you do is you have your cable right. plugged into your regular cable modem that's, right. that's already in your house. Or ADSL Or ADSL. Yep. So you take the output of that, you put it in this device, and then you can have your Xbox, PlayStation 2, PC, whatever, somewhere else in the house. Up to 100 feet is what they tell you. Right. And then so you take the other piece of this device and put it in that console. A lot of these wireless thingies. Yes. Is that the proper technical term? Absolutely. Normally cost three, four, five hundred bucks. Well, you can get this them, one. You can get them a little cheaper now because they're starting to proliferate. Everybody's talking about wireless internet connections. They're proliferating? Yes. Oh my go. God, someone should stop that. <laughs> We're going to have them all over the place now. The one thing to consider is that you need a power source for each end of the device. I think for the people who need a inexpensive device where they don't need to travel too far, I think this is a good recommendation. Absolutely. I heartily recommend the Nyko Net Extender. On the positive side, this thing does exactly what it says it's going to do. You can have wireless internet very quickly, very easily. And the price, when compared to other wireless solutions, is very good. On the negative side, you do only get about 100 feet of distance, so if you need longer than that, you might want to go with the more expensive products out there. Stick around, it's Metal Arms versus Kaya, right after this. Buried Treasure is brought to you by EB Games. Hey, here's a good one right here. Excite Bike 64 for the N64. Now, I gotta say, one of the best games on the NES, and it's actually in the arcades as well, Excite Bike. You remember this game? Unbelievable, right? Well, Excite Bike 64, still to this date, it's probably one of my favorite motocross games of all time. Not only do they have an amazing track editor where you can go in, edit, and build your own track, but I tell you, the fun about this game is that it has all these great mini games as well. Not just the racing around the stadium levels, but there's some really cool, fun outside levels where you go up in the desert, you're trying to capture flags, and the, the AI on this is really amazing. The sound effects are incredible. This is the best controlling bike game I've ever played. Excite Bite 64 from Nintendo for the N64. Check out this and other Buried Treasures at EB Games. We take games seriously. Buried Treasures brought to you by EB Games. We take games seriously. Hey, I've got an interesting buried treasure for you guys today. This one's called Star Trek Deep Space Nine The Fallen. It's developed by the company known as The Collective. They're the guys that did the Buffy the Vampire Slayer game and the brand new Indiana Jones game, Emperor's Tomb. And this one really shows off where the company was headed. It's a third-person action game, but it also has the first-person shooter type elements in it. There's lots of weapons to collect. There's bladed weapons and all kinds of projectile type weapons. You can play as Worf, Cisco, or Kira in the game. And there's a little bit of a branching type of mission thing going on at the beginning, but eventually all of the missions do become the same kind of path. Graphics are really good. They use the Unreal Tournament engine to build this game and it has really nice looking environments, some great looking lighting. There are lots of jumping puzzles in the game, but the controls are solid. Voices from the actors are in the game. And overall, it's a very fun game that you can pick up for your PC and even your Mac. I've got the game on the Mac and it plays wonderfully. It still stands up, even with today's technology, it still looks really good. Check it out, it's called Star Trek Deep Space Nine The Fallen. Today in Versus, we're taking a look at two mascot-style games that may have been overlooked. We've got Metal Arms Glitch in the System from Vivendi Universal for the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and GameCube. And we've got Kaya Dark Lineage from Atari for the PlayStation 2. What do you think of the graphics in these two games? No contest. Metal Arms is by far the superior graphically pleasing game in, in every aspect. The, the characters are really well done, the environments, you go into these caves and all these beautiful worlds, multiplayer, everything's amazing. Kaya, I mean, I'm just gonna come out and say it, the graphics are piss poor. I know, I, I, I know I, you're gonna say, I'm not gonna say, 
They're stylized. Uh, I, yeah, and that's they're, the not, style. they're not they piss poor. Hardly they at all. Suck. No way, man. They are about it's very, four years too old. I, I would agree that Metal Arms has a much superior look. I mean, it, I love the visuals. I love my robots. But I do think that Kaya's got a cool, distinctive look. I'm not a big fan. Yeah, it's called Bad. I, I'm not a big fan it's of the actual main character, but I like the environments. I like the wind effects that it creates throughout the but, game. But don't you think that the texture mapping on the ground, I mean, they look like PlayStation 1. No, hardly. Oh, no way. It's, come on. It's probably a little bit closer to the look of the original Jack and Daxter. It's scaled back on no, the texturing and stuff like no. that. But the worlds are massive. There's lots of stuff going I'm on. I'm not saying the worlds aren't big. I'm just saying the actual graphics nah. and textures themselves. I like the animations. I like the little the wolfen creatures that you're out trying to attack. I like the, the boomerang. I like that she's riding little creatures and she's hoverboarding. I'm going to coin a phrase. It's yes. very stylized. It is. And it works that's, for that's, me. That's, that's you know, right. I like the graphics in, in both games, but definitely Metal Arms Metal with the arms shiny robots sure. and the huge explosions. Now what about the gameplay of these two games? Well you know the whole character, the Kaya character and the storyline is just blah. There is a lot of things to do and a lot of cool things that she can do. That's what I liked about this game uh -huh. was the variety of stuff that you can do. The control I thought was very tight all the way through in Kaya. Control is alright. But now Metal Arms. Metal Arms. Metal Arms is more of a game. It's more of a I don't want to call it a button masher, but it's more of a shooting style. It's definitely a shooter. Overall, I think I like the gameplay a little better in Metal Arms. I, I like the gameplay of Metal Arms as well. It was much more aggressive, much more fun. We had a blast playing multiplayer. Now let's talk about the audio for both of these games. No contest. Metal Arms wins again. Metal, Metal Arms, I mean, the sound effects are great. Yep. I really enjoyed the music. The, the voice acting is great, as well as like some of the weird robotic effects they put on some of the voices. Hey, Crunk, were you able to repair our mystery box? Of course I fixed him. It was a huge pain in the waistband because he's some kind of custom jobby. But nothing I couldn't handle. Now, on Kaya's side, the oh. music was music was okay. Less than stellar. The voiceover, the worst Very bad. I've ever heard. Well, I wouldn't one, go that far. On one of these PlayStation 2 massive exploration type games well, like this. Okay. Because they spent a ton of money and time building these huge worlds to explore. And then they have like this stupidest sounding bird. It's like one guy. It sounds like a programmer. So annoying. You look confused. I would be too if I were you. Luckily, I'm not you. I'm me. <laughs> Tough crowd, I'll see. What's your take on both of these games? I appreciate the huge world that, that Kaya is. It just didn't do it for me graphically. I'm more of a twitch shooter kind of game, and Metal Arms delivered a little bit more on that, so right. I'm going to go with Metal Arms. I like them both. They're different styles of games. I mean, there's some parallels with uh, the collection and some of the stuff that you do, but I agree with you. Metal Arms, much more action, and the multiplayer is a blast. I'm giving Metal Arms an 8. 8.5 from me. What about Kaya Dark Lineage? Kaya gets the 7. I'm going to give Kaya an 8. Well, it looks like Metal Arms seems to be our clear winner. Absolutely. Make sure you take a look for that one. Today on the show, we took a look at Looney Tunes back in action for the PlayStation 2, but it's also available for the GameCube. There are cool characters in this game, and they've got funny one-liners, but there's some big camera and control problems in this one. On the GameCube, we looked at Kirby Air Ride from Nintendo. I love the fact that there were three different racing modes in this game. Tommy, well, he's got a hate on for Kirby. For the Xbox, but also available for the GameCube and PlayStation 2, we looked at Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy. We love the two different characters and the great looking environments in this game, but what happened to the voiceovers? In Versus, we looked at Metal Arms glitch in the system for the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and GameCube. This is a very slick robot action game with cool visuals and fun multiplayer. We stacked it up against Kaya the Dark Lineage, which is a huge action adventure with a very stylized look. Now we thought Kaya was a good game, but Metal Arms is better. In hardware, we reviewed the Nyko Wireless Net Extender. This is a cool lower cost solution for a wireless net connection. On the Game Boy Advance, Tommy reviewed SSX3. Now, it was a pretty good interpretation of the console games, but it was just way too slow. Well, thanks for watching our special DVD Extras episode. We hope you tape this one because if you watch it again, you can actually hear the Spanish language track. See. Si. Si. And don't forget, uh, how about widescreen mode? Right, we've got the extra special, more expensive widescreen mode as well. Very nice.
Can't wait for the extra director's cut edition where we're gonna make some serious bank. So what are you gonna give Looney Tunes back in action? What are you gonna give it? I'm gonna give it a six out of 10. Really? Yeah, what are you gonna give it? I don't know yet. <laughs> so what are you gonna uh, give Looney Tunes back in action? Wait, I'm still thinking, hold on. All right. It's either a seven or a 7.5. I'm gonna go with the same. Okay, here we go. Okay. This week on G4. Cheat goes Hollywood with exclusive codes for Mission Impossible Operation Surma. Hear ye, hear ye. It's SmackDown, here comes the pain versus Raw 2 on Judgment Day. I'm gonna kill you. Cheat, Tuesday at 10.30 and Judgment Day, Sunday at 10. Hi, I'm Chuck Norris. And I'm Christy Brinkley. The Total Gym is the one piece of fitness equipment that replaces an entire gym full of equipment. It's the fastest and most effective way I've ever seen to get into shape and stay in shape. A few minutes a day is all it takes to get into the best shape of your life. And we're not the only ones that feel this way. The Total Gym is now used in over 14,000 health and fitness facilities to train millions of people each year. It's the favorite of everyone from world-class and professional athletes to millions of families who have it in their homes. And with over a billion dollars in sales in 85 countries, the Total Gym stands alone. And right now, you can try it in your own home, absolutely risk-free, for an entire month. You won't even be charged for shipping and handling. Or you can ask for this free DVD and information kit. Call 1-800-322-1598. That's 1-800-322-1598. Let's go. One of the best things about the Wii U, and I keep reminding you guys, is that it can play Wii titles, and I've got a fantastic one here before. I may have mentioned this in a buried treasure, I can't remember, uh, but it's GoldenEye 007. This isn't the N64 GoldenEye. That has yet to kind of come to uh, modern day consoles, and it's probably got something to do with the rights of Pierce Bros and all that stuff. You actually play as Daniel Craig, or the likeness of Daniel Craig, and it's a retelling of the GoldenEye story from the N64 game with more modern mechanics, more modern visuals. You're a did a great job and you know the pacing and the speed and the changes from level to level and mechanics all worked really well this is a game that you're going to need Wiimote for and so you're going to have to put the sensor bar up and all of that and start pointing at the screen and stuff but they did a really really solid job there are some other control variations in there you can play it with the regular controller if you want as well I had a blast with this I know that Scott did too it was a really cool nostalgic look back at a classic game but it also brought enough fresh stuff to make this a worthwhile James Bond experience. In fact, it's one of the best Bond games I've ever played, and it's definitely worth digging up as a buried treasure to play on your Wii U. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Where are you going? Well, I understand there's uh, got to be a baseball extravaganza on your show this week, and I wanted to dress for the part. Oh, gotcha. Also, uh, something about Goldeneye and James Bond and uh, something about the game Uprising. Yeah. Yeah, down the electronic playground this week. Electric so. playground. The electric playground, so I want to get back in time to uh, watch it. Okay. Nice flip-flops. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tommy Tellerico. I've been writing music for video games for over seven years now, and I gotta tell you, it is one of the coolest industries on the entire planet. Now we're gonna take you inside the world of video games, like no one else has ever done before. Now throw in weekly reviews of the hottest new games, and you got what we call the Electric Playground. Welcome to Oakland Alameda County.
Yankee Stadium. In, in today's, today's game, the New, New York, York Yankees, Yankees take on the Oakland Athletics. Athletics. This is as real as it gets. I'm here with the world champion New York Yankees, and we're talking about baseball and video games. Donkey, come here. We got to talk about our Resident Evil game, bro. Resident Evil. Call that. That just, just came out. Big Bernie on the cover. Big Bernie's on the cover. Where's he at? Here, Bernie. Have you seen that? Yeah, have you played? Big Bernie. Bernie! There he is, right there. Bernie, come here, man. Baseball has always been one of America's pastimes, but you know, video games are catching up pretty good, huh? Yeah. Here with Andy Pettit, Kenny Rogers. What's your favorite game? I like uh, I like Resident Evil. Resident uh, we, Evil on the PlayStation. Yeah, it took us about three months to finish it, but we uh, three used months. The, well, used the book. You guys, all, you guys aren't very good. No, three but months? we're baseball players. Cool. Actually, I'll stretch with you guys. All right. I'm gonna leave this whole video game music thing, and um, I got a tryout with the Yankees in a in a couple of weeks, and we're doing this thing here. Okay. We're here in the largest motion capture facility in the world where some of the hottest Major League Baseball players are about to start practicing and getting into their black little suits to get set for their motion capture. Check it out. Action. Motion capture is when you put um, markers onto actors and have them go through movement and then you feed that spatial information from those markers into a computer and then build a spline based skeleton on those movements. We're here with Carlos Reyes from the Oakland Athletics. What kind of video games do you like? Triple Play 98's the bomb. What system? Sony PlayStation. Really? Yeah. How much you play that? Every day. Do you ever play baseball games on the PlayStation? No, uh, I'm not really, uh, when it comes to sports, I don't like, I don't know why. For some reason, I'm more into the uh, action fighting and all that stuff. You guys both say N64 is where it's at? Yeah. Tell me why, tell me why. Because the graphics are way better than PlayStation. No loading, you know? no, Wait, no loading, no, no loading. loading. You guys say what? PlayStation. PlayStation. You guys PlayStation. say what? 64, PlayStation. killer 64. Instinct. PlayStation. No, there's no games on Nintendo 64. Oh, what do you guys say? You guys say what do you guys Wait till, wait till uh, Chris. Look what you started, huh? Look what you started here, huh? What kind of video games do you play? I don't. <laughs> Sorry. You guys, did you guys play on the road at all? When you're, I, I know you travel a lot. Yeah, I take it everywhere I go. I take it. Really? Yeah, it keeps me out of trouble. I stay home and uh, have a good time. I love it. I mean, I stay two, three o'clock in the morning playing it. Excellent. This is Tommy Tellerico from the Electric Playground, and stay tuned because the game's about to begin. Why don't we do a comparison head-to-head -head between MLB 98 and Triple Play 98? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Cool. Well, right. I want some of those peanuts first, man. Oh, sure. Let's go. Both of these games, Triple Play 98 and MLB 98, are the two best baseball games ever made for the PlayStation. Graphics. First of all, I think you can all see that the graphics in Triple Play are a little bit smoother, a little more rounded, a little more realistic. The shading is nicer than the graphics in MLB 98. Disagree. I think the graphics are slightly better in there, but I think the images are, are sharper in here. And then the motion capture is just amazing. Triple Play 98 is great motion capture, but not as good as uh, MLB 98. I tell you, they're gonna have to bundle up tonight. A lot of turtlenecks out there on that field. Cold and windy for this game. Well, let's talk about the sound. Oh man, no contest. The sounds in Triple Play kick. The, the announcer in Triple Play is, is very detailed, very excellent. Uh-oh, runner's in trouble. MLB 98 also has great sound. Popped it up. But Triple Plays, because that commentator play-by-play -play is, is pretty excellent. Well, what it's got is two people in the booth giving the commentary, and it's got stuff where they say, the last time this guy was a bad, he hit a double. The most important part of any sports game, and anyone will tell you this, is gameplay. And that's where MLB 98 has triple play B. It's very easy to make a play in the infield. You know, when you, when you hit the ball, you can move your shortstop over and turn a double play real quick. I found it difficult to do that 
in triple play. It's very hard. In the outfield, it's easy, but it's very hard to make a play in the infield because the camera seems to like follow the ball. It's all a camera angle thing. But you're right. Some of the camera angles make it more difficult to play. So I would give MLB the slight edge for gameplay. Now the controls yes. for MLB 98, I know we, we differ a little bit here. I personally like in MLB 98, when you want to press the base that you want to throw to or run to, yeah. you actually press the button. Because on the PlayStation controller, you have the four buttons set up just like a diamond. So the top button is second base, this is third base, and this is home. I personally, I love that. You press one button to, to throw to a base, whereas in triple play, oh, you, right have, you know, you have play. to press the action button and then the direction on the pad. Yeah, but every baseball game, you press one button and it's hit right to the base. You, you press the one button, you point where you want to shoot throw it to and that's where it goes. Right, that's why this one's better because it's a little more different no. and innovative. Well, yeah, you play this game and you got to have like a computer programming degree to understand all the mapping of the buttons. There's oh, so many mapping. different... mapping. You, you press the top button to go to second, you press the bottom button to go to home. You got to be yeah. a programmer. What? Oh, nice game. One thing that I will give you is that I think the features in Triple Play 98 are a bit better. Oh. Like you have, uh, one thing I love is instant replay, which which that has. Well, not only instant replay, this game's got eight players at a time to play at the same time. Yeah, because you always play with eight people. That, that happens <laughs> all the time, I'm sure. Well, if you've got friends, you do. <laughs> the cover of my game looks better than yours, all right? All right. MLB, you got my boy Bernie Williams here. T tell me, Vic, who is that on the cover? I don't know. You guys know who this guy is? He's a, he's a cardinal, and uh, yeah, I have to admit, uh, Bernie Williams on the cover. All right, That's Bernie Williams, the boy, all the Yankees right. rock. Got him third. Bernie uh, what would you give that game? Uh, this game um, gets a 9.2. Okay. That game there gets an 8.9. All right. I'd give uh, Triple Play 98 a 9, and I'd give uh, MLB 98 8.5. Very close. Yeah. You got to try them. Great games. Hey, what's going on here? And get ready for. EP's here at the Much Music Video Awards. Do you play any video games? We're there. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, we only play four-player games like Mario Kart, things like that, because there are four, you know, there are five of us, but only four of us play at a time. Pong, Defender, and Pac-Man. Super Pong. Actually, Virtual Fighter, I have to say, is pretty cool. I don't know. I kind of like the old ones. Pong is one of my favorites. Mr. Pong's Chinese food video game. Amazing. The sweet and sour uh, tennis bats are amazing. My name's David Usher from the band Moy. Bruce Gordon, band Zion Mother Earth. Ja from the Doughboys. Actually, on the bus we play Nintendo 64 all the time. We play Star Fox. Someone from EMI bought us a Sega Saturn for our tour bus. Well, have you tried GoldenEye? Because that's a four player. Is it a four player? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we definitely will because I didn't know it was. We get every four player game there is, so that's, that's the next on the list. Are you guys being approached to do the soundtrack for any video games? Well, you know, it's funny because I was just talking to your, I don't know what he does, but I just did uh, the music for a new Bruce McDonald movie. And uh, and we really were, we were talking about doing like music for video games and what a cool idea it would be. Has Rusty decided to do any soundtracks for video games? For video games? Yeah. Well, we haven't decided. I've never been asked to do that. That would be really fun, actually. If you could create a video game about your band, what kind of, what kind of adventure would you take your band on? You would have to go to a lot of different worlds. You go from, from space, to underground, all, all different places, underwater. You want to go to many different worlds, many different environments. That's the main thing. If I could make a video game, uh, it would be something that doesn't have to necessarily do with shooting people. Do you play any PlayStation games? No. You know why? Oh, no. Because I don't have PlayStation. Yeah. I think they should make a video game of, of yeah, yeah, like, you know how they have those sim games, you know, where you build a town? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you have a music one where you build a career, you know? And you have your band like just starting up. Uh, it's like, oh damn, the bus broke down. What do you do? Something to do with music. How about that? Something to do with dancing. A dancing video game. That's what we do. Yeah! All right. Stay tuned. The Electric Playground will be right back.
When Cyclone Studios produced Battlesport on the 3DO, many people thought they couldn't top themselves. Well, they're about to do just that with their latest game entitled Uprising. Uprising is a new kind of game. It's a blend of action and strategy. The best kind of action you find in a game like Quake, the best kind of strategy that you find in a game like Warcraft or Command and Conquer. You're down on the field, you see your troops running by you, you see bombers overhead, you hear all the sound effects, it's like you are there. You play most of the game from the perspective of a high-tech tank called a Wraith and jump into the perspective of uh, citadel towers, these are like big gun towers that can defend your land. It's now online and it's looking for anybody to attack. It's going to start kind of patrolling the skies, moving around. On the surface it's an action game, um, you know, and, and you'll see you'll be driving around and you'll see all these enemies and you'll be shooting at, at them, but the real way to succeed at the game is by commanding all these other forces. Now let me just take care of these guys. <laughs> They're stupid enough to, to attack a tank. Not very smart. Finally, a game that wasn't you against 50 million other pieces. We really wanted you to feel that you know you were part of this allied force, and you're playing a big part in it. But you know you really have to use its entire resources: these bombers, these jets, these troops, these allied tanks, as part of your offense. Um, Cyclone's a small company. We really need to put a lot of wood behind one arrowhead, so instead of doing a game for three different pl platforms and just really spreading our resources thin, we want to just pick the right one and just you know, put all our efforts behind that. I mean, personally, for me, I, I just love you know, making games and I love the high-level concept of you know, a game like, okay, we want this game to feel this way or that way. Um, it's okay if I'm not involved in all the creative details, I just want to believe in the spirit of the game. And as we've gotten bigger, you know, we've been doing more games, and so you know, we have one game in one genre that I really like, and another game in the genre that I'm really crazy about, and so you know, it's just a great time. When the first World Series baseball game came out for the Saturn, it was one of the greatest baseball games ever. And then the next year, it got even better than that. Now, World Series Baseball 98 uses 3D polygons instead of 2D sprites. Let's see how it's changed the game. What we can see in the background here is um, World Series Baseball 98. We've gone with a polygonal version, um, keeping the same engine but, but upgrading it to polygon uh, characters. I think the sprite base had a nice, clean, polished look to it and worked really well. What we wanted to do is, is continue the realism and the authenticity of the sport. So what do polygons offer that sprites can't? Motion capture um, and more realistic movement. By shortstop and throwing the ball to first stop and second baseman in the way he's going to duck. Jumping up to catch the ball. Jumping up to catch the ball, the sliding, the banging the bat on the ground when they strike out, the yep. kick in the dirt, facial expressions. Uh, what about gameplay enhancements? What's, um, what's different with it that way? Gameplay has stayed pretty much the same, except we've upgraded a little bit and made it more realistic as far as um, the pitching style isn't just any pitcher can do every style of pitcher. It's more based on what the pitcher really has in his arsenal. Um, you're going to get the true fastball from Manny Johnson. Um, you're going to get Nomo's outrageous swing um, and wind up. So it's more realistic all it's around. It's more simulation kind of right? thing. Um, and I think some people like the arcadiness, and that's still in there. We didn't completely break away from that, okay. but we've just upgraded to more of an authentic uh, lineup, which is our pretty much our overall theme. Initially, people were like, well, you know, it doesn't look necessarily as clean. It looks really cool, and I think it looks great. It's yeah. just, it's a difference and it takes a little while adjusting to it. But um, overall, once you play it, it's like, wow, this is really cool. This is realistic. This is, this is true baseball. EP talked to Ken Lobb of Nintendo about James Bond's newest adventure, GoldenEye, for the Nintendo 64, developed by Rare. Tommy Tellerico. Do you know being a villain is a very competitive business this days? You know, I was bummed because the guys got to meet the Bond girls. And I was invited to come. I love to play Nintendo and I love this game. We're able to give players a really lifelike scenario. The enemies look like real people. The environment that you play in is an actual blueprint from the movie GoldenEye 007. And in essence, you're there. You are James Bond. You play the game a lot and you watch the movie, it's like, hmm, 
been in that room, seen that light switch, you know, this texture is taken right from the movie, for example. I mean, and I went to an arcade show in Japan and I met Tim and Chris Stamper along with uh, Mr. Takeda, who was the guy who headed up the development of the, of the Nintendo 64. And after the show, we went to NCL. And Mr. Takeda, being very technical, had already been to Rare and he knew that this was going on, but he hadn't seen it, you know, actually in that state of a complete level. I found through white paper testing that a lot of the people were failing on the earlier missions, not just because the missions were hard, but because they were having trouble figuring out the mission objectives. <laughs> on top of that, it wasn't just figuring out the mission objectives, they were trying to learn the lay of the land. You know, they were lost and trying to figure out mission objectives, and they're getting destroyed by these incredibly intelligent enemies. So it was pretty obvious to me, why don't we just remove some of the mission objectives from the earlier level? The other thing we did with GoldenEye, which is very important, is even when you earn the codes, you cannot use the codes in the regular game. What happens is as soon as you go to the code screen and bring up a code, you get a special cheat level select, and you can only go back to the levels you've already beat. So you can't use codes to earn other codes, and you can't use codes to beat the game. I think it will give you a pretty good feeling. I've, I've tried the game, and I really got caught up in the, in the suspense and the intrigue, and I really felt as though I was part of this world. I felt like I was making the movie again. One of the things I pushed for early on was also the lean and duck. When you play these games, a lot of times what you're doing is finding a corner and then strafe right, strafe left, strafe right, strafe left. Um, so I thought it would be kind of cool to be able to do what you always see in the movies, which is hide behind something and kind of, you know, pop out, bang, 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 and then be able to immediately pop back to exactly where you were standing. And then to be able to do this in a way that when you pop out, you're always aiming at the exact same point as, you know, so it's something that's highly repeatable. You know, what they did with the AI of the enemies and the way that they hear and see you, what they've done with the, the idea of the cameras, you know, the idea of what am I doing with these missions that are somewhat obscure and yet they tie in so well with the movie. You know, you really feel like you're James Bond when you play this game and that's just because you're not just looking for a key and you don't want to shoot everybody because people might hear you or they might see you shooting someone and then go hit an alarm and then the enemies come en masse and uh, you're in trouble. Don't move a muscle. Our reviews are coming right up. This is a great outlet. I think it's kind of a specious or fatuous set of reasonings to, to blame video games for people who have not been brought up correctly. It, it all starts with a good household and an upbringing. I love the violence in video games and, and I've never perpetrated any sort of violent crime on anyone in my life and don't plan that I ever will. So I, I don't think it's the bugaboo. Today on the Simpatico Question of the Week, Kevin Spencer asks, why can't we buy more video game music? Over in Japan, hundreds of thousands of video game music CDs are sold. Final Fantasy being one of the more popular ones. Over in Europe, they take video game music and do dance remixes on them and play them in nightclubs. Now over here in North America, it hasn't really caught on yet, but if you go online, you can find a lot of different websites that'll actually sell all the video game soundtracks, including the very first musician to ever come out with a CD worldwide, Capitol Records. And you can also find Tommy Tellerico, Greatest Hits, Volume 2. Hey, don't forget to send your questions to ep.simpatico.ca. World Series Baseball 98 for the Saturn. On the Sega Saturn. This yeah. has always been one of the best titles, I believe, for the Sega Saturn. This year they went with 3D polygonal dudes. Um, the stadiums are rendered beautifully. They have every single stadium in the league. Uh, the one thing about the graphics, the bat looked like they were holding like a big two by four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but aside from that, the graphics were excellent. That's got potential. Uh, the sound was okay. The music was a little funky because they had to go with MIDI and a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, a solid, solid title. Um, you know, I give it an 8.9. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I kind of preferred the old uh, World Series baseball games. I liked. <laughs> I liked '97 and uh, and the and the first one on the Saturn. They were both really cool. I love the the new one too, but I think the uh, the polygon stuff was kind of unnecessary. It looks slick. 
I like the the new camera options that they have, and it's got these little cool little cinema intros. Right. Uh, I think I agree with you with the the two by four. I like the new I, I like the new pitching options. I think that gives it a little more simulation feel, but I, I, I still prefer the old World Series. I'd say it's 8.5. Goldeneye on the N64. Oh, sweet, now, sweet game. to me, Goldeneye is the best N64 game out. I, I put it above Mario, I put it above Wave Race. I mean, the texture maps, the graphics on this thing are excellent. Now, and I usually do not like the Doom Quakes. I don't go you know, bonkers for them like everyone else does. This game I did, yeah. the sound effects are just amazing. Of yeah. course, you got the whole Bond story and the character is there. It's so excellent. Yeah. The, uh, the missions are well thought out. The, uh, the intros and little cut sequences the, the, are, are, are excellent. I would totally give a 9.4 wow. to Goldeneye. Wow, that's Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I love the game too. I think it's better than Turok and I loved Turok. Uh, there's a lot more complexity in this game. The graphics are incredible. It's easy to see that the uh, second generation Nintendo 64 games have got some killer, killer visual. And it's true to the genre. I think it's the best Bond game that's ever been produced. And the four player options are amazing. Right. Really, really cool. I like the way you can take the gun and you, when you when you hit different ricochets, you hear the sound. And I mean, you can like ricochet the wall, go back and the bullet holes will still be in there or oh, the wooden so crates sweet. and you get the different sounds and everything. It's and, excellent. And all the weapons. Yeah, I, I'd give it a 9.5. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed our baseball extravaganza. I'm going to play me the very first video game ever of all time. It's called Computer Space, a simulated space battle that pits computer guided saucers against a rocket ship that you control. <laughs> I'll see you later. Production assistance for the Electric Playground was provided by Nintendo of Canada and Heat.net. All right, World Series Baseball 98 for the Saturn. On the Sega Saturn, it's got to be. Well, can we hear all this? Continue dancing? Show it's a futuristic flame war, GameCube connectivity. And someone gets battered. Oh, and I'm back. Diane Mazota, and welcome to Filter, a hand-picked top 10 video game countdown show. With Dave. 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 Huh? Bell? The transmission has begun. Oh, hello, and welcome to Filter. I mean, Portal. Stay tuned for Portal. Hello, and welcome to Portal's Salute to the Elements. Let me ask you a question. How often do you take the elements for granted? Were you truly thankful the last time you drank a glass of water? Or the last time you roasted a hog over an open fire? Or what about the last time you made mud burgers? Remember, 
Without the elements, none of these things would be possible. No, and let's not forget that the elements are not just limited to air, water, earth, and fire. Dave, according to a broad definition of the term elements, my data banks have isolated over 300 substances and energies which fall under this classification. Exactly. So, let's begin Portal's salute to the elements with a man who's made a living of mastering the elements, a theurgist in the Dark Age of Camelot named Quattro. Patching now, Dave. Oh, wait, wait, wait one sec. Really quick, it's no biggie, but I should warn you that Quattro has, like, some split personality issues, helps him divide up the three schools of magic in his own mind. No big deal. Enjoy. Come here. Keep your voices down. These woods ain't safe, and I'm stalking something big, mean, and ugly. See? All right. Here's the deal. Listen good. I'm a theurgist. That means I can bring on the magic in three different elemental schools. The first line of spells are Earth spells. Watch. Hey, kids! It's Mr. Stinky! Let's make a shell so we'll be super safe from the monster people! Golly gee! That looked neato! Hey, let's make a damage buffer too! Then we won't go away when the monster people try to bash our heads in. Yuck, yuck. Okay, we're ready. Let's hit them with some ice magic. Ice Elemento! Ice Elemento! You blast the monster with spells! Oh, but you can't fight hand to hand! So I deal all some damage myself! Boom! One less scumbag in the forest. Frost Blast and Ice Cloud. Gets him every time. Let's pay a visit to an old buddy so I can show you about group combat. Park. What's up, Quattro? Nothing, except a good fight. Let's go. Oh, wait. It's a long run. I can fix that. Here, let me use my air magic. This spell will make you run like the wind, mighty warrior. Huh? All right, let's go. Bingo. Target acquired. Here, let me buff your weapon. Yuck, yuck! I'll use an earth and power spell! Now it's super duper dangerous! Yuck! Go! There's another one! Don't worry, strong one. My air spirits will stun him while you fearlessly finish your fight. I could use some help here. Yuck! Well, sure, buddy boy. My Earth Elementals pack a real punch. Yuck, yuck! And the Blasting Cyclone! It will hit the monster so hard! Bam! Earth and air. Does the trick every time. I'm out of here, Quattro. You're getting weirder every day. Wait a second! Come back here! No one turns their back on Quattro! Let go of me, butt wipe! Not smart to call me names, pal. Wait! Don't hurt him! He didn't mean anything by it! You Stop it, you three! You're driving me crazy! Look out! He's coming! Get out of my head! I'm trying to... What a freak. He was perfectly normal till Hollywood called. Whatever. Hi. So, as you can see, with a little help from Earth, Wind, and Ice, a Theurgist is a formidable magic user indeed. Now, let's take a moment to look at an upcoming virtual world that will feature golems and spells made of the elements themselves. It's called Horizons. Take a look.
horizons will soon be accessible to virtual explorers everywhere. We'll keep you posted here on any important developments along the way. Portals Salute to the Elements will return in a moment. Portal Salutes the Elements. What's my favorite element? What kind of nut job goes around asking that? Hmm. Satin, I guess. Satin. That's an element, right? Portal salutes the elements. Hello. My favorite element is rubidium. I love rubidium. God, how I love it. <laughs> it makes me happy. It's a wonderful, fabulous, fantastic element. Oh, feel it. Welcome back to Portal Salute to the Elements. I'm Dave. Now, so far, we've been taking a look at the positive aspects of the elements. But the elements can also be an extremely dangerous thing, especially when infused with dark magics. So, right now, let's head into the world of Asheron's Call to take a look at how a bad encounter with the elements can drive a man to the brink of madness. I remember them. I remember it all. The voices, the pits, that inhuman crackle. So unreal. What was I doing down there? So foolish. So foolish. It was one of the most sought-after treasures in Dareth, the Helm of the Elements. With it, your defenses would be unimaginable. I remember when I first heard whispers of it. It had to be mine. It had to. So young, so naive. I would need to gather four crystal fragments from the bottom of four distinct dungeons and attach them to a Nifis Helm. That was all it took to build it. Easy. <laughs> No one told me what would be in those dungeons. I was ready for the undead, or rats, or so help me, even shreths. But not... not them. They were placed there as guards by an evil wizard. Elementals and, and elemental golems, like nothing I'd ever seen. I witnessed them first on the surface, an event which released the fire dungeon's magics into the sky. And I shuddered. The burn. Why did I go down there with those things? Why didn't I turn around and run at that very moment? The burn! It was like a maze. So lost, Olthoy at every turn. And then deeper, and more lost. And then they were there. Magma golems, embers, flames, fire everywhere, and the heat. Oh, God, the heat! But I found it. Down there amongst the ruins, I found the first fragment. The fire fragment. Lord knows how. I could have stopped it then. I, I could have sold it, been a rich man. But I could feel its power. The hunger, it drove me. I couldn't stop. The ice dungeon was next. Cold! Never, never have you known cold like that. Not until you felt the hands of a frost elemental. But this dungeon, it was identical to the last, in layout at least. And somehow I remembered the twists and turns. Past glacial golems and terrible drops, I found the second fragment too. And still I couldn't stop. The acid dungeon, so much worse than the first two. The Olthoi were different here, more savage, eviscerators. And then there was the acid itself. Coral golems fused with it, over level 300. I wouldn't dare fight them. I ran and ran until the smell of acid nearly made me collapse. I only fought when running was no longer an option. I still have the scars, but I found number three. Only one left. The most dangerous element of all. Electricity itself. I... Oh, I can't. I... Oh, so horrible. I... Oh, I barely remember. But what I do... So clear! So crystal clear! No! It was too much. After all of that, I recalled out. I prayed. I bathed. And I ended up here, in this den of my own madness. I'll never leave. What's the point? What's the point? We're going to die! They're going to escape those catacombs one day and we're all going to die! Run. Run. Try and run, please. Somebody tell me, what's the point? Ah! Ah! 
Oh, man! Just kidding! Did I have you guys going or what? Oh! oh, oh. Wait, excuse me? Oh, oh, you should have seen the looks on your faces. Wait, v Vincent, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm just messing with you guys. All that post-traumatic stress stuff. Oh, I'm level one. I haven't even been to a dungeon Wait, yet. Vincent, are you out of your mind? How could you do that? I'm trying to build credibility with my viewers here. You Chill can't... out! I did my research. It was all accurate. That's not the point. Ah, oh, come on. I was just having some fun. You gotta admit, that was pretty good. I have quite a bit of acting experience, you know. I almost got cast in the Titanic uh, oh, okay. sequel. Okay, enough, enough. I, I can't believe this. I am so, so sorry for that. I I'm flabbergasted. Listen, I promise you, this will never, ever happen again. Val, can we check our posts and emails, please? Certainly, Dave. All right, here's an interesting one. I tried to get my dad to watch Portal, but he thought it was dumb. He didn't like the fact that Dave said, Hi, I'm Dave, when it says it on his suit. Well, let me tell you, sir. I would agree with you if this was here to indicate my name, which, yes, is Dave. But this Dave does not signify me. Dave is actually the brand name of this flight suit, like Nike or Armani. As some of you out there probably know, Dave makes some of the best flight suits in the business, as well as phenomenal underwear and girdles. The fact that my name is Dave also is a mere coincidence. If this transmission was run by a George or a Philip or a Gio Colosi, this suit would still read Dave. Dave. Next email. This one's from Serenity. Dave, I love you. Will you marry me? Well, Serenity, yes, absolutely. Your timing is actually perfect. I've been thinking quite a bit lately that having a spouse would be an excellent means for me to both conquer my loneliness and... Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt, but based on your current schedule and responsibilities, I have calculated that you would not have sufficient time to participate in a marriage scenario. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. What, what how about just a girlfriend? No, Dave. Portal Salute to the Elements will continue in a moment. Please stand by. Portal Salutes the Elements. My favorite element? Well, uh, I'm not sure. Purple, I guess. It's real pretty. Portal Salutes the Elements. My favorite element is You got that? I'd like to take a big smelly right in my own hand and wipe it in your ugly face! Hi, welcome back to Portal Salute to the Elements. I'm Dave. <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know, Rick is a dear friend of Portal. He's even saved my life once. Now, Rick used to look like this, and then this. But recently, long story, his soul ended up in the body of an aged but legendary warrior named Anvil. Today, he's been kind enough to agree to introduce us to the elemental creatures of EverQuest. Val, patch us in. Connecting now, Dave. Oh, hey, brothers. What's shaking? Hey, this is the Twilight Sea, man. I know a bunch of elemental dudes that moved up here hoping to run into Jimmy Buffett, man. Check out the colors here. It's like the origins of tie-dye, man. It's like staring into a prism on your way back from heaven. Come on, let's go find my amigos, man. Whoa, there's Callie. I ain't seen him since we trashed that mink farm near Fresno, man. You are a fool to travel here, Anvil. My fire will sear your flesh. Yo, chill out, brother. I ain't Anvil, it's Rick. I switched bodies, man. Captain, how you doing? Groovy, dude. I'm working for Portal now. <laughs> right on. Hey, brother, I gotta know, you still dating Sunflower, man? Nah, she got all whacked out and started shaving her legs, dude. Oh, man, that just ain't natural. Next thing you know, she'll be wearing a bra. Hey, listen, brother. I'm here to show these portal dudes your magic fire. Can you help me, man? <laughs> no problem, brah. Check out this kaleidoscopic goodness. Whoa! Righteous, brother. You still got it. 
Thanks, dude. But you want a real show? You should go talk to Portland. Portland? Boo, brother! Whoa, whoa, Captain, me Captain. Is that you? Long time no trip. Where's Gordinia? Oh, man, she ran off with Carnation, man. Oh, whoa. Yeah, and they didn't invite me neither, man. I broke that chick out of the University of Brainwashing, too. Hi, Sruff. Can you do your water show for Portal? Oh, no, Frog. Woohoo! That's crazy, man. <laughs> you like that here? Check out me little bro. He's all grown up now. He's an air elemental. Oh, hey, brother. He can't speak. He snuck his vocal cords at a fish concert. Wannabes, dude. <laughs> no kidding. Dakota, do your trick. Not bad, little dude. Hey, where's Nevada? Oh, no one told you, man. I oh, drowned. He was trying to break some dolphins out of a tuna net, and he got all tangled up. Whoa, bummer, man. Bummer. Yo, Dave, I ain't got no Earth Elemental for you. He drowned trying to free sacred aliens, man. Oh, this is too much. It's not fair, man. It's not fair. I can't take it. Oh, I got to take a nap. Thank you, Rick. Very, very interesting. All right. Well, that just about does it for Portal Salute to the Elements. However, we have one other very important piece of business to attend to before we go. The Drifter. Dave, Sergeant Tuesday is standing by. Excellent. Now, as you know, the Drifter, the virtual world's greatest hero, has been missing for some time now, vanished without a trace. But clearly, this should be of great concern to all of us. Who or what could make the mighty Drifter disappear? It's a terrifying thought, but fortunately, the incomparable Sergeant Mo Tuesday is on the case. Connecting now, Dave. So the Drifter was missing, the world's greatest hero out there somewhere, a victim, a captive, maybe even dead. Dark thoughts, but not unusual ones. I'm a cop, Sergeant Mo Tuesday's the name, and my job was to find the Drifter. Whoever had him didn't want him to be found. It would take a brilliant plan to uncover even the slightest lead. Have you seen the Drifter? No. Have you seen the Drifter? Nah. Have you seen the Drifter? The Drifter? Hmm. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to step out of the vehicle, ma'am. What vehicle? Don't get smart with me, ma'am. You're coming down to the station. Dude, wait. Since when are there cops in Camelot? Hey, this ain't a station, it's a rock. A wise guy, eh? All right, book him, Fred. Huh? I had made 600 arrests and still no leads. This case called for a different approach. Hand him over. Excuse me? Hand him over. And who? Hand him over. Uh, hey, man, I don't know nothing about my boss holding five Lurikeens captive at her place. Nothing! Now leave me alone! I suspected I might have stumbled onto another case. I followed him. Hey, boss, I think some copper onto us. I think he knows about the five Lurikeens you got chained up next door. Five Lurikeens chained up next door, eh? Sounds like a crime. You have led him right to our doorstep. Very well, officer. You have discovered my little Lurakeen lockdown. But what are you going to do about it? You are unarmed. And we are not! Wrong, ma'am. These are loaded guns. Turn over the Lurakeens or I'll shoot. Guns? <laughs> you are mad. There are no guns in Camelot. Ma'am, I need to warn you. I can draw fire and holster faster than your eye can follow. <laughs> you idiot! It was a shame. It didn't have to end in violence. But the bad guys chose their own fate. At long last, the Lurikeen lockdown was over. This case was closed. My name is Mo Tuesday, and I am a cop. Um, okay, Mo, it looks like you forgot about the Drifter, but nevertheless, amazing work. Your service to the virtual world is always appreciated. Val, 
Yes, Dave. Keep looking. Certainly, Dave. Thank you. Well, that about does it for today. Log on to g4tv.com slash portal for more information or to contact us directly. Take care. Hi, I'm Bernie. I'm Dave's best friend. My favorite emelin is water. It's yummy when you're thirsty and you can go swim in it. Hey, will you watch me go swim now? Yay! Seconds, someone in the world dies from tobacco. In 1990, a tobacco company put together a plan to stop coroners from listing tobacco as a cause of death on a death certificate. Now, why would they try to do that? Rated everyone. It's everything you wanted in a motocross game, plus a bunch of stuff you would have never thought to ask for. MX Unleashed. Ever wondered what it's really like to be a soldier? What do you got? I have a sit rep from Alpha Company. Get ready to be verified. Verified. Put yourself in the picture with this free video. You'll see over 200 great jobs in the Army and over 180 in the Army Reserve. You'll also see what skills you learn, how you can earn money for college, even what soldiers do in their free time. Call 1-800-984-ARMY now and get this free t-shirt and your free video. Put yourself in the picture and see what it's really like to become an Army of One. Finally, the Destructo is now complete. Destructo, come to me! Attack mode. Attack mode. Attack mode. No, Attack mode. No. Attack mode. Halt. Attack mode. No, Destructo, halt! Attack mode. is a story about no violence <laughs> the sex gambling buxom beautiful girls in sort of full 3D a man he's a very striking man just looking at him is like put in awe whenever you see Itagaki at any of these press conferences or shows he's a very sort of rock star guy who made a game what made Dead or Alive so great was that speed and a fluidity, which is really unique to their games. That saved a floundering developer. Dead or Alive literally means dead or alive. For the company, it was a very critical situation. And raised the bar for 3D fighters. It was just Tomonobu Itagaki asking the question, what can we do? How can we expand the fighting game genre?
Can we take it in a more mature direction? DOA is like a sushi bar with roller skating girls serving wasabi on the sushi. It's fun. This is the history of Dead or Alive. While growing up in Japan, Tomonobu Edagaki knows exactly what he wants to do when he grows up. Well, like everybody else, I entered the game industry because I wanted to make video games. His wish comes true in 1992. I had no idea which company would be good for me, so I didn't care if I worked for Tecmo or Sega. And Tecmo was located close to where I lived, so that's why I chose Tecmo. Big American hit was a tech mobile for the NES. And that was just a simply brilliant football game. And it was surprising because it came from a Japanese company. I worked as a graphic programmer for the Super Famicom in my early days at Tecmo. Edagaki's first project is Tecmo Super Bowl for the Super Nintendo. As he climbs the corporate ladder at Tecmo, a new innovation in fighting games shows up in arcades. The big development in fighting games in the early 90s was uh, moving to 3D. The early pioneers in 3D fighting games, you have to speak about Yu Suzuki and the Virtua Fighter series. Just when that came out in the arcades, it was astounding. People had been used to fighting in two dimensions, moving back and forth and maybe jumping over one another, but not actually moving in three dimensions. But while arcade fighting games are going through a minor renaissance, Tecmo is facing troubled times. Tecmo was not in great shape. They had a lot of deficits for two years. So in terms of business, if the company had three years of consecutive deficits, it would have been very critical. The up-and-coming developer makes a bold move. I made a deal with the current president, Mr. Nakamura, to start a project. I made a promise to him that I would make a game that would sell. And for this struggling company, it's their last chance. So, dead or alive literally means dead or alive. For the company, it was a very critical situation. That's how he came up with the title. Edagaki wants his game to stand out in the crowd. I liked Virtua Fighter, but if I used different ideas to describe it, I would say it's an old traditional sushi restaurant. And on the contrary, the DOA is like a sushi bar with roller skating girls serving wasabi on the sushi. It's fun. For the beginner, fighting games were not easy. So that's why when designing Dead or Alive, we try to simplify such aspects of the game as much as possible. One new idea is the danger zone. The danger zone is kind of like a joker when you're gambling and playing cards. Before a danger zone, there was a notion that fighters were fighting inside a ring and maybe if they went outside that ring, they would lose the match. We wanted to add something entertaining and spice up the fighting game genre. That's why we created the danger zone. But now, with Dead or Alive 1, a danger zone was activated, where if you entered that zone, you would take damage. It made fighting more strategic. You're limited in your space, and if you go outside that space, you're not going to lose the match, but you're going to jeopardize your position. Another element that separates Dead or Alive from the other 3D fighters is a little provocative. The first Dead or Alive game featured the first uh, movable breasts in video gaming. At times, it would be like almost like you were watching a, a Skinamax movie. Well, I think entertainment needs sexuality and violence. So if entertainment lacks sexual elements, then it's entertainment no more. Ironically, Dead or Alive is developed for the same Model 2 arcade hardware that powers Sega's Virtua Fighter 2. 
However, Sega is not involved with the development of the game. I had an EO lunch once with Yu Suzuki. That's the only relationship I've had with Sega. I have never received any programming resources from the company. In November 1996, Dead or Alive ships out to arcades around the world. Tecmo holds its breath and puts its faith into the girls of DOA. It's November 1996, and Dead or Alive has just shipped off to arcades. The game is one of Tecmo's last gambles to stay in business, and it hits the jackpot. The first Dead or Alive did very well in terms of sales. It's certainly a very good game to play. Well, Mr. Nakamura was very happy about the success of DOA, so other Tecmo games could be created and sold. The previous year, Tecmo posted a loss of $5.2 million, but in 1996, Tecmo pulls in a profit of $9.2 million, thanks in part to Dead or Alive. What made Dead or Alive so great was that there's a, all of Tecmo's games have a speed and a fluidity, which is really unique to their games. There's just a, an amazing sense of control about the game. I'm different from the other game designers because I work to win, so my way of thinking is much different from the others. Work begins on home versions of Dead or Alive, as well as a sequel. To get the job done, Edagaki creates his own development team made up of the best of the best from Tecmo. It was reasonable to establish a brand because at the time, Tecmo was not releasing a lot of games. That's why we were trying to create a new brand, and that's why Team Ninja was created, to give Tecmo an identity. Team Ninja members all have certain levels of skills. Compared to other development companies, ours is much higher. It's easy to work with such highly skilled people. Team Ninja is a, is a mystery. Tomonobu Itagaki really likes Team Ninja to be sort of like ninja-like in the way it handles itself. Itagaki doesn't let people inside it. Very few people ever get to see the inner workings of Team Ninja. He's not very active in speaking about its history. He likes it to be sort of in the shadows. He likes the games to speak for themselves. <laughs> Team Ninja was created to turn the table, to change the situation of the company, which was in bad shape. In September 1997, Dead or Alive is released for the Sega Saturn. It comes to the PlayStation one year later. Dead or Alive was remarkable because it really did 3D fighting well on the PlayStation and on the Saturn. And those systems were just beginning to find themselves in terms of three-dimensional fighters. The developers were sort of struggling, like how do we get to push all these polygons and to still make a good, smooth fighting game? Dead or Alive was one of the first ones to actually do it very, very well on a home console. In 1999, Dead or Alive 2 hits arcades. Dead or Alive 2 improved on the original in a lot of ways. Beyond the graphics, the amount of move sets available for the characters expanded greatly. Each character has their own separate story. When I started making the game, there wasn't a lot of characters involved in games like Street Fighter. So back then, characters only meant the difference in one's costume. So when I designed the characters, I put a lot of concentration into each one's voice, taste, and attitude. I designed characters based on their personality. And there were multi-tiered stages, so players could beat your opponent in a very flashy way. Bang them against the wall, flip them over, and then knock them across something that's going to explode. You could knock a character through a wall over like a cliff, and they would actually plummet and take damage. It's a really neat way to expand the genre. In early 2000, a home version of Dead or Alive 2 comes out for the Dreamcast. PS2 owners have to wait until December of that year to finally get a copy of the hot sequel. Get ready, fight! The differences between the Dreamcast Dead or Alive 2 and the PlayStation 2 version, which was subtitled Hardcore, there were a lot of different lighting effects. Get ready, fight! In fact, a lot of people complained that the lighting effects were overdone. There was an over-brightening effect that made everything look sort of bleached out to the point where you actually lost some of the really sharp, striking coloring that was seen in the Dreamcast version. There were new costumes added. 
and a lot of graphical fineries done for the PlayStation 2, which was supposedly a marked increase over the Dreamcast version. But basically, the two games in their core were identical. Dead or Alive 2 brings in more than $2 million in sales. Plans for Dead or Alive 3 begin, but what Team Ninja has in mind is a radical departure. By 2001, the Dead or Alive series is in the same league as other 3D fighting classics, such as Virtua Fighter and Tekken. But Adagaki wants to set the bar even higher with the next edition. To do so, he makes two bold decisions. The first is to skip creating an arcade version of Dead or Alive 3. Not the American in the American market, even though you can still find arcades, it's pretty dead, so it's useless to provide arcade games for them. It's the same situation in Japan, so it's useless to provide arcade games for them as well. The second is to develop the new game exclusively for Microsoft's new console, the Xbox. One of the most important reasons why we developed DOA 3 exclusively on the Xbox was that we could concentrate on just making the game. In the case of the PlayStation 2, when we want to realize an idea, we can't concentrate on just making a game. It involves preparing a specific library just for our ideas. That's too troublesome. Working on the Xbox was an ideal situation. We could concentrate solely on making the game. Fan reaction to the Dead or Alive series going on Xbox was certainly mixed. Tomonobu Itagaki made a conscious decision to take Dead or Alive to Xbox. A lot of fans were disappointed by that, but a lot of Xbox fans were ecstatic. <laughs> it's a very good series, and it's now exclusive to Xbox. I didn't think choosing to develop exclusively on the Xbox was a big gamble, because comparing the machine specifications to systems like the PS2, Xbox was much higher. I make my games to win. I can make a better game with a higher spec machine. So as a writer, I'm like a fighter pilot. The PS2 is like a Zero Fighter, or the Xbox is like a Hellcat. I had confidence to win with the Xbox, so it was quite easy. In November 2001, Dead or Alive 3 comes out exclusively for the Xbox, and gamers are floored by the new title. It's a great game, great fighting game. And, you know, people really liked the idea of having this sort of fantastic fighting game that showed off the power of the Xbox. But without Dead or Alive 3, I think the Xbox uh, would have had trouble courting a lot of the hardcore fans who absolutely need a great fighting game on their gaming system. Dead or Alive 3 did very well on Xbox. It was a launch title. Tomonobu Itagaki and Team Ninja got the graphics spot on. They showed the world exactly what the Xbox could do. He expanded on the notion of multi-tiered stages. Not only could you knock somebody off a platform, say, but you could knock them off a huge platform, and they would go through a floor and bounce down. The environments were absolutely amazing and beautiful. There were really picturesque environments I don't think could be rendered on any other gaming system. And for a company like Microsoft with the Xbox, their goal was to really try and, you know, find games that would show why the Xbox is a better system than the PlayStation 2. And Dead or Alive is one of the only games, I think, that really sort of showed the power of X, as they say. Both Microsoft and Tecmo win big. Only five months after its release, Dead or Alive 3 sells more than one million copies worldwide. Already, Edagaki has plans for another addition to his growing franchise. But what he has in mind is a little different. It's 2003, Dead or Alive 3 is a hit. And Team Ninja starts work on a new game which has been on Edagaki's mind since Dead or Alive 2. When I was developing DOA 2, fans requested that we add beach volleyball as a minigame because other fighting games had similar minigames. Edagaki has a very <laughs> playful nature. He had an idea. What if these women were on an island 
and they had two weeks to have a lot of fun and play some volleyball. You know, maybe from just a simple daydream, you know, a, a whole video game emerged. But I didn't want to put this very simple idea into my series. So when I made the beach volleyball game, I wanted it to be a standalone title. In January 2003, Edagaki's self-proclaimed gift to gamers is released in the form of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. One of the hallmarks of the Dead or Alive franchise has been these buxom, beautiful girls in full 3D. That's like what people associate with Dead or Alive, or these you know kind of completely over-the-top girls that Itagaki really prizes himself on creating these sort of amazing babes. I'm creating entertainment rather than just a video game. So in terms of entertainment, it's quite natural for me to create beautiful women. It makes sense rather than bringing ugly women into the game. It's very simple, naturally. While the new game already shows off plenty of skin, it's not enough for some gamers. In fact, I find the nude hacks irritating. If they're so talented at doing such things, why don't they use their skills for something more meaningful? So when you see a girl in DOA, I can understand why one would want to undress her. But if you do so, you really should be embarrassed. And it's the eye candy that gets Tecmo into trouble at 2003's E3. People flock to see women in bikinis, and Tecmo knows this. Dead or Alive beach models promoting Dead or Alive extreme beach volleyball threw out volleyballs and people would go nuts. It's just good fun. At times it's become such good fun that fire marshals had to come and actually close Tecmo down for a while. While the world falls in love with the women of Dead or Alive, Edagaki and Team Ninja continue to expand the DOA franchise. Due out in 2004 is Dead or Alive Ultimate, the first DOA game with an online element. Dead or Alive Ultimate was only shown on huge screens at E3. There were a lot of striking images shown. Just absolutely insane. There was this one where you were in sort of this like African safari. One of the fighters knocked the other into a pool and then picked him up and spun him into an elephant. People love that stuff. It was very well received. Dead or Alive Ultimate is like an archive. We're releasing it for fans of Team Ninja's work, such as the DOA series and Ninja Gaiden. The ultimate thing that they've done, so to speak, is bring the game on Xbox Live for online fighting. And because Dead or Alive is so fast-paced, I think that's what people love about the idea of doing it online. And there are still more Dead or Alive games in the works beyond DOA Ultimate. Dead or Alive Code Cronus is the world of Dead or Alive Zero, before the first DOA. You've seen the opening movie in Dead or Alive Ultimate with the children. Dead or Alive Code Cronus has a relationship with that movie. As far as Dead or Alive 4, it's coming out for the next Xbox. Dead or Alive 4 will be a game describing the world of DOA tech, which is the counterpart of the ninja side. Dead or Alive has grown to be one of Tecmo's most successful franchises, thanks in part to its mysterious creator. Everybody give it up for the amazing Tomonobu Itagaki. He's a very striking man. Just looking at him is like put in awe. He's always got sort of shades on, he's got the black leather jacket. He prides himself as being a real rock star of the industry. He's a very nice man, he's a very smart man, who is very passionate about video games. He's very outspoken, he will tell you exactly what he thinks of certain games, what's right and what's wrong with Dead or Alive. And he says these sort of crazy over-the-top things that you just don't believe come out of his mouth. No violence. Violence. Entertainment. Beauty. Sex. Gambling. Gambling means that if people really like playing a game, then they'll pay whatever it costs. And that's all. The hottest gear. The latest gadgets. All the things you need. Some you might not. Join Diane.
Zota's filter gets the lowdown on all the high tech at the Consumer Electronics Show, Monday night at 10. Ted? Barbara? Something's missing. Missing? In the bedroom? In the where? Trojan Man! Trojan Man! What are you doing here? I'm here for her pleasure. For what? Trojan Her Pleasure condoms. They're new, uniquely engineered to satisfy a woman's anatomical sensitivity <laughs> while helping to protect. You like this idea? I love it. On there. New from America's most trusted condom, Trojan Her Pleasure. The pleasure she wants, the protection they trust. My job is done here. <laughs> <laughs> I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is the Evil Covenant is back in Halo 2 and they're bent on destroying the Earth. The good news is we've got the scoop on every dirty trick you'll need to blow their brains out. So stick around and let's cheat together. <laughs> Welcome to Cheat, the show that proves cheaters never win until they press up, up, left, left, and jump to enter God mode. This time, we're earning our wings, making sure you don't have to take an early dirt nap playing Halo 2. We captured bungee insiders and tortured them with an energy sword till they dropped the dime on Halo's spruced up weaponry, hijackable vehicles, and Xbox Live capability. What's that? What's an energy sword? You need this show more than you think, my friend. Master Chief gets some fresh rations for his return to the Xbox, including a family-sized can of whoop-ass. Help him serve it up to the Covenant and save Earthlings from extinction in the totally immersive, wicked-fast Ramjet Halo 2. Our goals were more about uh, creating really memorable places. We wanted to make missions where you could really tell where you were and why it was important to be there. Well, we went through a lot of effort to make sure that every level has unique and special things about it. With a fan base that makes Trekkies look blasé, Bungie could have slapped together any old sequel and still outsold its competition. But never content with even their best, they bumped up the graphics engine and poured on the texture mapping to make Halo 2 the coolest looking Xbox game ever. You'll love every pixel of the game's fancy new look, especially when you get your hands on new marine weapons like the battle rifle, SMG, and a retooled Magnum pistol. Of course, the Covenant bad boys have some new iron too, including the carbine, beam rifle, fuel rod cannon, root shot, and I gotta get me one of these, the energy sword. Also notice cool new abilities like dual wielding weapons, which can make for some devastating combo moves. And if you like the look of that ghost your enemy's riding, take it. You can also hijack vehicles this time out. Have the Bungie boys been playing GTA on their break time? Of course, love is nothing till you give it away, which is why Halo 2 is Xbox Live enabled. So we built our Xbox Live component as a system link game. So we have this system called Party Invites, where you can send a party invite to up to 16 friends, and they join together as one cohesive unit, almost like one player. 
and they can move around on Xbox Live and, and play other teams. If you want to go check your statistics, if you want to go look at your clan, if you want to set up clan events, if you want to find out what's going on with the game, if you want to look at maps of the game you played last night and find out where you were killed, you can go to Bungie.net to do that. You can find out detailed statistics about yourself and anyone you ever played. It's, it's going to be a massive part of the game going forward. You ever notice that old school guys like James Bond only use one gun, whereas new action stars use two? I guess it's because 007's enemies try to fight him with their stupid razor hats, while more futuristic foes tend to tear it up with dueling plasma guns. Anyway, in the always cutting edge Halo 2, you're invited to double your pleasure by dual wielding certain select weapons. Check it out. You know the old saying, it's not the size of your weapon, but how many of them you have that matters, or something like that. The point is, you're now twice as deadly thanks to Halo 2's dual wield weapons feature. First off, not all weapons can be dual wielded. Only the plasma pistol, plasma rifle, needler, SMG, and Magnum Pistol work together in combination. But do the math, that's still plenty of punch. Learning which combos to bust out when is half the game. When combining weapons, consider the different properties. An energy weapon like the plasma rifle works well when coupled with the SMG, which can pepper your target with explosive projectiles. Going up against an elite, knock out a shield with the plasma burst and then make them dance with a little SMG fire. The plasma pistol is another handy piece of ordnance, especially at close range. Charge it up and use it as you would the plasma rifle. Then finish the job with either the magnum pistol or the SMG. What's that? You say your magnum's empty and you left your SMG in the ladies' room? Never fear, whip out the needler. It's a great projectile weapon in a pinch, unleashing a volley of smart homing needles. Just make sure to keep a lock while you're firing and the little stingers will do the rest. Okay, Covenant, you ready for a piece of this? Stay with the Master Chief. He'll know what to do. Okay, you dirty cheaters. Time to recharge your energy shields and reload your needlers. Or just grab the last snack pack from the fridge before your brother eats it. Whatever you do in your downtime, hurry back, because next up, we're going to walk you through some deadly levels and reveal the location of Halo's ultimate weapon. Go to Game Tag where you can play hundreds of the greatest video games from the greatest systems right from your broadband-connected PC. You can play everything from arcade hits like Pac-Man and Sonic to modern favorites like Tomb Raider, Splinter Cell, and more. There are over 400 games, with new ones added each week. And if you sign up today, you'll get two weeks free. There's no long-term commitment required. And GameTap takes you beyond the games with funny and original shows you can watch whenever you want. Oh boy, it's gosh. I hate level three. In seconds, you can be dodging missiles, fighting aliens, and who knows what else. Play now at GameTap and experience the new world of video games. GameTap, expand your playground. Play now and get two weeks free at GameTap.com slash now. Some games rated E to T, not all games rated by the ESRB. <laughs> Welcome back to Cheat, the show where you're losing only until your opponent looks away. We're taking you through Halo 2, and next you'll find out how to turn more coats than Benedict Arnold by playing as either the Human or the Covenant. You know, I've been dying to see what goes on in those steamy Covenant shower rooms after a firefight, so send me your pictures from your camera phone, okay? Sick of saving your fellow man from destruction? Switch sides and play as a Covenant Elite in Halo 2. In the Oracle mission, you are the Arbiter. What would you have your Arbiter do? A disgraced elite who is blamed for Halo's destruction. The Prophets dispatch you to a mining facility to kill the Heretic Leader. In the first laboratory, you'll meet the Heretic Leader, but only in a holographic form. I wondered who the Prophets would send to silence me. And soon after, you'll be reintroduced to the pesky floods. Clear out the floods in the lab and move on to the elevator. In this section, your goal is to basically stay alive until the elevator reaches the bottom floor. Here, the Sentinels will be trying to kill the Floods and all foreign organisms. That means you. Take them down when you have a chance and use their Sentinel beams on the Floods as well. The best weapon to fight off the Floods is the Energy Sword. Use it against the combat forms and it will leave nothing for the Infection forms to bring back to life. 
Once you reach the bottom, continue until you reach the second laboratory. There will be a small group of heretics fighting the floods, so just let them kill each other. Once it's quiet, jump down and clean up the place. The doors to get out of the lab won't open up until all the floods are eliminated. It doesn't get any easier as a small group of heretics will storm the lab, but a couple of well-placed plasma grenades should clear your way. Make your way across the bridge and eventually into a large hall. Here you'll find the heretic leader, but that coward is hiding behind an energy screen. This will save me from the storm, but you will be consumed. We shall force him out. How? The cable. I'm going to cut it. Work your way up to the elevator and engage in combat only when necessary. Once you reach the top, cut the cables from the three corners. Once the mining facility begins its free fall, head back down and chase the heretic. After flying your banshee to the next station, the only thing that separates you and the heretic leader is the flood. Make your way through the blue colored doors and up the ramps. When you reach the hangar, prepare for a showdown. Arbiter, I would rather die by your hand than let the prophets lead me to slaughter. He'll create two holograms of himself, but you'll only need to kill the real one to finish the mission. A frontal assault here means instant death as you'll be outmanned and outgunned. Use cover when possible and use the energy sword's lunge attack to knock down his shield and finish him off. I had no choice, Holy Oracle. This heretic imperiled the great journey. Scarab gun. It just sounds badass, doesn't it? Well, if you want to test drive the universe's ultimate tail toaster, get your pen ready. There's only one way to find the game's most powerful weapon. But be warned, this is no walkthrough in the park. For a limited time, get the amazing Scarab Gun. It slices, it dices, it gets rid of unsightly nose hair, and still blows your enemies halfway to hell. See this one? It's terror! Now, how much would you pay? But wait, this amazing Covenant weapon can be yours free, if you follow our secret pathway. We've all run the simulations. They're tough, but they ain't invincible. Start off on the Metropolis level, and eliminate the Marines that board the Scorpion. You'll be glad you did. Cross the bridge as you normally would, and destroy all the ghosts and race that you encounter. When more Marines join the fight, though they are your own guys, take them out as well before reaching the end of the bridge. Then, take out the Banshees that attack you, but leave one in the air. Also, make sure to hijack a ghost before entering the tunnel. Lure the Banshee into the tunnel by shooting it periodically to keep it interested. When you reach the first barriers, take out the Warthog and the Marines, or they'll destroy the Banshee. Continue to lure the Banshee past the second barrier and eliminate any Covenant resistance. You'll notice the Banshee will get stuck in corners repeatedly. The best way to get it out of the corners is to stand behind it and walk backwards until it retargets you. This will save a lot of frustration. The hardest part of the whole process is to lure the Banshee into the small tunnel. And through trial and error, you should have the Banshee in this position. This is the part where you will either succeed or cry and start over. When you see loading done, immediately board the Banshee. If you inadvertently trigger it without boarding, then the Banshee will disappear and you'll have to start over. But if you're able to board it, then pat yourself on the back. You've done it. Navigate it out of the tunnel and fly toward the twin bridges. In the middle of the first bridge, you will see an orange cone, your holy grail. Swap it out or dual wield it. You now have the most powerful weapon in the game, the Scarab Gun. Special delivery for the Covenant, and it ain't no candy gram. Put the scarab gun down. It's me, okay? Trying to give a girl a heart attack? I was going to tell you how to find a bunch of human skulls, but I think I need a minute here now after having my life threatened. Watch these commercials. Can I get some water over here? In news that's rocking the music world, rapper Proof was shot and killed. The member of Eminem's D12 crew was gunned down outside a bar on Detroit's famous Eight Mile Road. Proof's real name was Deshaun Hilton, and he was the inspiration for Mackay Pfeiffer's character in Eight Mile. International soccer superstar David Beckham could be headed for the United States. Mr. Posh Spice hints that he may sign with a U.S. team after his contract with Real Madrid expires next year. 
And finally, in a first for the Emmy Awards people, nominations for online and mobile content have just been announced. Major networks, productions like MTV Stand In and Fox's cell phone series 24 Conspiracy did top the list, but smaller shows like It's Jerry Time also got the nod. All right, guys, that's all you're getting from me. For more on today's top stories, visit g4tv.com slash the feed. <laughs> Welcome back. Sorry about that. You just freaked me out a little bit. Anyway, on a lighter note, is there anything more amusing than watching two rival parties of the same species blow the crap out of each other with plasma and needle guns until they're just smoking needly corpses? I didn't think so. Luckily, that's just what you get to do in the next level of the game, the Grave Mind. What is that? I am a monument to all your sins. Ever wonder what happened to Audrey too from the Little Shop of Horrors? Well, he spawned himself into the future as a self-proclaimed bad weed with an orb that sounds a lot like C-3PO. Greetings. I am 2401. I am the monitor of installation 05. We received a reviewer request from Master Chief JR1 for tips on how to complete the mission Grave Mind. Kill the demon. Once you start the mission, there will be two honor guard brutes in the chamber. The quickest way to take these big monkeys down is to hit them constantly with the needler weapon so it creates an explosion. Once you kill a brute, the other one will go into a berserk rage. They don't have shield generator. It's berserking. He'll begin his charge attacks, so jump out of the way when he gets near you and repeat your offensive attacks. Eventually, your attacks will bring him down. Take their plasma rifles and get ready for the next wave of enemies. Root is moving through the lower levels of the tower. I'll reverse this grab lift. As you make your way down the corridors, take full advantage of all the corners and doors around you. Playing hide and go seek with the Covenant will shield you from any further attacks, giving you enough time to regenerate your shield to full strength. Now finish off the rest of the enemies and make your way down to the next level. Here, Chief, jump in. Here, Cortana orders you to free Marines held captive by the Covenant in the lower levels. I'll be on that, okay? You neutralize the guards. Take out the big brute in front of you and take shelter anywhere safe to regenerate your health. Take out the rest of the jackals and grunts in the area and free the captive marines in these cells. Once you free the second wave of marines in these holding cells, make your way back up the grav shaft to the next area. The same cast of characters will appear in this area and are easily killed until you meet the hunters. You can try to take out these body armored aliens, but that'll just get you killed faster. Make like the flash and just run right past them and the hunters won't even get a shot off. Hit your next checkpoint and move on. Once outside, you'll find a battle raging between the Covenant and the Heretics. It's a good strategy to stay out of their way because eventually they'll kill each other off. Take out whoever is left and move on to the next stage. The place is now crawling with enemies from both sides looking to take you out. Take refuge in any corner or corridor to keep yourself alive and stock up on any weapons the enemy leaves behind. Fight your way through and you'll make contact with Cortana, who will give you more information about the Prophet of Truth. I'm picking up two more transponders. It's the Commander and Johnson. They're closing on Truth's position, Chief. They'll need your help. Congratulations, mission complete. Make your way across the bridge behind the mausoleum to finish your objective and to rendezvous with Johnson and the Commander, who have now been taken prisoner by the Covenant. Next up, you'll learn where to find Halo 2's nifty collection of skulls. Why do you want skulls? Hello, to drink the blood of the vanquished out of. Am I talking to myself here? Actually, they make legendary mode even harder. Throughout every mission, there are secret Easter eggs in the shape of human skulls that can change the physics of the game, like the Sputnik, which will send your enemies back to their home planet. And if you look closely at one of them, you can see strange numbers on the back of their heads. Most of the skulls in the game are only accessible when played on Legendary, but the blind skull can be found on any difficulty mode. Begin the mission outskirts by heading towards the hallway with the flashing light. Once inside, turn right and look up. Jump towards the halogen light, then turn right and crouch jump to the rooftop. Make a left and you'll find the blind skull at the end of the passageway. Once you pick it up, it'll make your HUD and yourself disappear, making it a lot more difficult to target the enemy. 
The next skull can be found in the beginning of the armory mission. When the Sarge appears, don't get in the elevator quite yet. Wait for him to say this line. Would it help if I said please? Now get in and take the elevator up. When you get to the tram station, walk to the opposite side of the doors and press up while holding down the X button. The skull will be on a stack of green crates near the end of the ride. Once you pick it up, the skull will make the Covenant more aware of your location, making them the champions of hide-and-go-seek. There are plenty more skulls to be dug up, so send us an email to cheat at g4tv.com to let us know which ones you find, and we'll add them to our Cheat Sheet Master Database. I don't know about you, but all those skulls are making me hungry. Hang out here a minute while I go shoplift some munchies and a strawberry milk. When I get back, I'll show you the game's greatest glitches and give you a peek at the big boss. Live from E3. Believe it or not, I'm watching E3. I never thought I'd get in so easily. Watching G4 in my beatable chair. What will I see? Believe it or not, it's E3. Live coverage of E306 coming in May only on G4. <laughs> Why, you no good, low down, dirty, yellow, cheating scum. Welcome back. If there's one thing I love, it's taking advantage of the week. That's why I'm so psyched about this segment, which will show you how to manipulate the flawed fabric of the game itself via its glitches. In Halo 2, fragging your friends over and over in multiplayer mode can get kind of boring. Good thing there are cool glitches to wipe away the boredom. To make Master Chief fly faster than a speeding bullet, select any level where there's a Warthog and Banshee vehicle. Line up the passenger side of the Warthog to the back end of the Banshee. Get in the passenger side of the Warthog and lock on to the other player by pressing the right trigger. Once you've locked on, have the other player fly as far away as possible in the Banshee ship. When you get out of the Warthog, you'll immediately fly towards the other player. Now properly thank your friend for giving you a copy of Superman 4 for your birthday. Also, create an aerial ballet with the Scorpion tank as you launch it into the air with the greatest of ease. In the mission Delta Halo, destroy the shield generators on the ground and park the tank over them. When the shield regenerates, it'll send the Scorpion a mile high. Ever wondered how hard Master Chief's head is? Well, take your plasma swords and have one player jump on top of the other player's head. While targeting the top player, have the bottom player repeatedly press the X button and the right trigger as the top player jumps up and down. If done correctly, you'll be able to reach new heights. Okay, now I'm going to spoil the whole game for you. God, I'm so happy. At the request of my very favorite viewer, um, you know, what's his face, the guy with the shirt? Yeah. I'm going to show you the last level of the game. No, seriously. So if it destroys any semblance of joy you could have taken in playing Halo 2, please blame him. Our long voyage is at an end as we answer another viewer request. Rocco E is looking for hints and strategies to defeat the final boss, Tartarus, in the mission The Great Journey. Here, you'll play as the Arbiter as he tries to stop the Halo from being activated. Most of the objectives in this mission are relatively simple as you jump from one vehicle to another to find him. The Hunters have come to our aid, Arbiter. They will fight by our side. Stay close behind these hunters and use them as your 400-pound linebackers. They'll open up holes in the enemy's defensive line, giving you a clear path to the goal line. You'll find your toughest challenge in the objective Delusions and Grandeur. Only an army of brutes stand between you and 50 hours of self-imposed seclusion. The best strategy to pacify these primates is to use your plasma grenades and sword. Throw the grenades at the brutes so they stick to them giving you a sure victory and wield your sword for closer combat. Put down the icon. Put it down and disobey the Hierarchs. There are things about Halo even the Hierarchs do not understand. In this final battle, inside, the Arbiter is aided by Johnson and other elites loyal to him. Tartarus is surrounded by a force shield that protects him from any attacks, and he also wields a large hammer that'll inflict a lot of damage on you, so keep your distance. Stand back and let your allies take down his shield. Only after a melee of offensive attacks will Tartarus' shield finally come down, making him vulnerable to any weapon for a few seconds. Stay in visual contact with him and watch for his shield to dissipate, and eventually you'll bring down the Covenant's captain. 
Quick, while his shield is down! We've got a new contact! Unknown classification! One of ours. Take it out. This is Spartan 117. Can anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. All right, my felonious friends, we've crib noted our way through another episode and didn't get caught. Remember, if you run into a roadblock in your favorite game, don't whip your console through the TV. And whatever you do, don't practice. Instead, visit the message boards at g4tv.com slash cheat or send an email to cheat at g4tv.com and we'll help you out. For a recap of everything you've seen today, check out the Cheat Sheet Master Database. Until next time, I'm Kristen Holt and I'm a cheater. G4 TV for Gamers and Tech TV are connecting to form G4 Tech TV. Coming May 28th, stay connected. For more information, go to G4TechTV.com. The number one movie in America is 51st Day. Got it, moving out. One, two, three. With all the madness. Oh. And more. Nice. That was pathetic. Shut up. 51st Days, rated PG-13. It's Ashley's 10th oh, birthday. I think he wants it back. <laughs> Gotta have twisted sweet. Gotta have new juicy fruit grape melon and strappleberry. Hi, I'm Todd Cook for 800 Credit Card Debt. Let's say this $10,000 is your credit card debt. By paying only the minimum payment, it would take you more than 30 years to pay off and cost you thousands of dollars in interest. Or you can call 800 Credit Card Debt and get a nonprofit debt management company that can eliminate penalty fees reduce your interest rates, and lower your monthly payments. They negotiated my payments down substantially from $300 a month to $135. I had $3,500 worth of debt, and I had four credit cards. And I've been on the program for about seven months, and I've lowered my debt to $2,700. 800 credit card debt is the better choice. Call 1-800-769-2926 for your free and confidential credit card debt analysis. Call in the next five minutes to see how fast you can get out of debt. Call 1-800-769-2926. I'm Lawrence Fishburne. You're watching G4 for Gamers. Today on a very scary X-Play, freak out as a frog humps your face in Resident Evil Dead Aim. Tremble at Silent Hill 3 and scream all you want during the third installment of Clock Tower. Okay, that's taking it too far. It's game time. Spawned by the devil, or someone wearing a devil costume, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. <laughs> Welcome, children of the night, to this terrifying installment of X-Play. Uh, I don't think our target demographic is children of the night. That's more an unscrewed thing. Do you feel a tingle of the tip of your spine? That's the icy finger of fear, friends. Um, Crawling. if someone's finger is the base of the spine, you could maybe sue or prosecute or something, or consult the authorities. I don't think that's right. Morgan, I'm trying to set a mood. Yes, well, it's creepy in a sad forest kind of way. That's the point, except for the sad forest part. Oh, but you know what? I really hate being scared. You know that. Remember what happened when uh, I had to review Silent Hill 3? Well, that's right, you're a baby. A little edgy. I'm going to Silent Hill. What's in Silent Hill? Time for another trip to the city that Sanity forgot in Silent Hill 3. <laughs> this is Heather, a 17-year-old girl with a shady past and a connection to the titular township. All I know 
is that things are getting really screwy around here, and I got a weird feeling it's got something to do with me. It does indeed. But I'm not going to spoil that for the viewers. <laughs> Heather is a refreshing heroine. She's not a ninja trained in special forces combat or some kind of secret agent. She's just a typical teenager complete with typical teenage apathy. I'm a detective. Well, nice talking to you. For God's sake, all she wants to do is go to the mall, like any teenager. She goes to the mall, all right, and the mall goes straight to hell. Your best bet for survival in Silent Hill 3 is avoiding danger rather than shooting it to death. Heather isn't a whiz with guns, and she'll never be mistaken for a master samurai. She's also rebellious enough that she won't do everything you tell her to. Get it. This is way too gross. I'm with her. Whatever's in that dirty toilet can't be that important. Who would even think of doing something so disgusting? Unlike typical survival horror games, Silent Hill 3 is rife with questions of religion, belief, and destiny. You will birth a god and build an eternal paradise. In fact, both you and Heather will spend a lot of time without any real idea of what's happening. If I knew that, I wouldn't be so confused, would I? By the end of the game, though, all your questions about Silent Hill will be answered. The game connects up with the rest of the series in many ways, and you'll recognize locations and themes from previous Silent Hill games. What's the deal with Silent Hill, anyway? It used to be a nice, quiet little town. Hey, learn to adjust, Sam Spade. One thing that hasn't changed is the control. There are no special advances in core gameplay mechanics, and it works just fine. I do appreciate the new and improved arsenal, especially the submachine gun. Silent Hill 3 is a truly disturbing and frightening experience. It's comparable only to the finest horror games out there, and second to none of them. We give it a 5 out of 5. By the way, if you're the sensitive type, like me, Silent Hill 3 will make you jumpy and give you bad, bad dreams. So play in a happy place. No, no, uh -uh. You know, the, the Beware of Morgan sign is it's still on the door of the game lab. Well, you scream playing Mobile Light Force 2. Who wouldn't? All right, now kids, feast your eye on a game that can only exist in a dark world of cross-licensing. Behold, if you dare, my favorite scary game of all time. Here's my tour of Aliens versus Predator 2. Aliens are scary. But the aliens of, well, aliens are the scariest. The developers of Aliens vs. Predator 2 knew this, and they wield this instrument of terror like a Stradivarius. Taking a cue from Jaws and, well, aliens, you don't see your mucus-covered adversaries for a little while. Hey, it's a boat! But when you land, you quickly realize that things are not too good. You see, people should have skin, people. Blackwell, report! Things are really f***ed up. Oh, what's that sound? Uh oh. Harrison, nope, we'll there's you. no aliens here. That's not good, though. Oh, wait, wait, maybe here where it's really dark and menacing. Ah, my motion detector's going off. Oh, okay, okay. No aliens. Go in this room. What's that noise? Maybe it's a badger. Ah, 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 aliens. Choo, 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 choo. Ah, ooh. Oh my god, they're everywhere! Oh! Mm, ooh, ah, choo, 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 ah, ooh, ah. That's pretty much the experience of playing this game. It's as tense as my colon after a crawdad festival. It's dark, the aliens move like rockets, and you never have enough ammo. And I love every moment of it. Though, one segment deserves special attention. Get along with my gun. 
Okay, walk carefully. No one can hear. Oh dear. I love this. Play that game and like the whole time you're just, oh my god, what's killing me? What is killing me? Yeah, the game was scary. Except when you screamed. That was amusing. Well, we'll be seeing many more scary games in this episode. So, Morgan, what is your favorite scary game? I don't have one because I don't like scary things. Which is why I don't want to play AVP2 and I don't want to review the sequel if they... They, they made one, didn't they? Oh yeah, they did, they made it. They made it into a freaking real-time strategy game, which we gave a two out of five. Coming up! The crew of X-Play spends a night on the town! Look into the face of terror, and you'll see Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb playing their Game Boys. I'm scything with my sight. Welcome back to the Chamber of Lost Souls we call X-Play. I thought we called the viewer mailbag the Chamber of Lost Souls. No? My lovely co-host may be trying to break the dark spell I'm weaving, but nothing can shake me from my black purpose to show you freakish, scary gaming wonders like Resident Evil. You're starting to look a little freakish and scary yourself over there. Oh, I stopped taking vitamin C. Oh, I can see that. Okay, the remake of Resident uh, Evil on the GameCube had sharks and fast-running zombies, and those both freaked me out. Now, the Umbrella Corporation's dark secret has staggered onto the PlayStation 2 for one last bite. Okay, well, here's a review of Resident Evil Dead Aim. Adam! <laughs> Something wicked this way comes in Capcom's latest. Resident Evil Dead Aim pits southern twanged survivalist Bruce McGivern against the usual pile of animated undead, courtesy of the insidious Umbrella Corporation. As you progress through the game, you'll confront some new, virally engineered, like dead mutants that in some cases you'll choose to run from rather than throw down with. The atmosphere and environments are decked in dreary, providing plenty of blind spots for surprise attacks. This contributes to the overall sense of hopelessness within the game. However, don't let the darkness dim your view of some interesting graphic detail. On the ocean liner level, for example, almost every room seems to be festooned with empty liquor bottles. Maybe the crew hasn't turned into fleshy zombies after all. Maybe they're just on their fourth or fifth round of Manhattan's. One of the aspects of the game we liked was the third-person perspective for exploration. This can be instantly ratcheted down to first-person shooter when you need to cut your way through the tall grass of undead which block your path to glory. The crosshairs and aiming ability are gracefully accurate. Headshots save precious ammo and quickly rid you of the stumbling dead. Especially when they prefer to attack like a pack of festering autograph seekers outside Neverland Ranch. Right and left indicators warn you of impending doom from unseen enemies. Be wary as some undead seem to be much faster than others. A predictable inventory system accompanies your character as he or she gathers healing herbs, keys, access cards, weapons, and tidbits of helpful information. Sometimes the game itself even advises. Safety and save points reassure the player with happy synth music that seems straight out of an episode of Buffy. With this time away from horror, one can afford to let loose. Can you feel Got some health and ammo and is back to the crossroads for a little bit of the ultraviolence and objective-based problem solving. The cutscenes do well at furthering the plot as well as introducing us to a Chinese intelligence operative pulled from the cells of anime. Though possessing a keen fashion sense, she doesn't seem to be in possession of any unique fighting capabilities. Every once in a while, the characters simply trade off, offering to hold back the tide while the other sets off on another level objective. This game succeeds where other versions of Resident Evil's Gun Survivor series come up weak. 
good graphics, analog controls, first and third person perspectives, and shooting accuracy leave us no choice but to give Resident Evil Dead Aim a 4 out of 5. Those zombies remind us of our fans. Adam, your shirts are so ugly. When is the next Final Fantasy? Morgan is hard. All right, now that me out. Mm. Ah. Up next, <laughs> the semifinals of the Olympic Women's Screaming Competition. <laughs> In space, no one can hear them scream, except the spacemen. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to X-Play, where Adam is going to drive crazy. Crazy? With fear? Something like that. Uh, your horn is starting to go limp. Yeah, I know, that happens when you get older. But now, we have a game filled with suspense, terror, and a guy with a big mallet. Not a mallet. Yes, a mallet. It's our review of Clock Tower 3. Here's the recipe for your basic horror video game. Creepy monsters. <laughs> An Uncle Fester look-alike. And a big mansion. Oops, or Clock Tower. I guess that's where the name comes from. The story in Clock Tower 3 unfolds like a B-horror flick. You play an innocent teenage girl named Alyssa. Aren't they always innocent in these things? While she's away at boarding school, Alyssa receives a letter from her mom. The letter says not to go home because of some unknown danger that may threaten her life. Do as I tell you and hide as quickly as you can. Alyssa! You're wanted on the telephone. It's your mother. And, of course, there's the phone call with Hello? no one Mom? on the other Hello? end. Are you there? What's wrong? It's those damn Hello? telemarketers Hello? again. Hello? Mom? Hello? Like a moth to the flame, Alyssa races back home, only to find the house empty. Well, maybe Mom? not completely. As you explore the area, you'll find clues that will unravel the mystery surrounding the disappearance of dear old Mum. But you'll need to stay alert since the mansion is littered with surprises. Who's playing that? As for Alyssa's abilities, they consist of walking, crawling, hiding, oh and don't forget, screaming. <coughs> Throughout the game, you'll encounter a horde of monsters that love nothing better than to chase girls. The best course of action is to run away, but they always seem to be one step ahead. Unfortunately, you're played with shoddy controls. Much of this is due to the camera angles, which seem to work against you in tight spaces. On the other hand, the game does take a fresh approach when it comes to combat. Your main weapon is holy water. It ain't a rocket launcher, but it gets the job done. Hot, 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 ah! One of the unique features in Clock Tower 3 is the panic meter. The meter rises if you're under attack or if you sense danger close by. Ah! Once it fills up, you'll have no choice but to stop and tremble in fear. <laughs> Snap out of it and run, you wuss! The voicing in the game is excellent. Where are that if you got to? I've been waiting for you, waiting, waiting. And the cutscenes are right out of an exorcist flick. Don't go in there! If you're playing in the dark, Clock Tower 3 is gonna scare the crap out of you. We just wish the controls and camera angles were less scary. We give it a 3 out of 5. <laughs> I told you not to go in. Alright, I'm scared. And I want to go home now. Adam? 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 What? Adam? What? Sorry, it's beaver teeth. Beaver teeth? Yeah, beaver teeth. They were out of vampire teeth at the store, and, and then I saw that they had beaver teeth. When you see beaver teeth, you, you, you gotta get beaver teeth. Here, here, hold this for me. In a moment! 
Gentlemen, scariest game ever. They are Death Incarnate, Adam Sessler, and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to the last rung in the ladder of terror. Let's play. Okay, you can cut it out because I'm freaked now. Oh, but this final game is the most blood curly monstrosity I have ever laid hands on. Quit it. So, Morgan, you know. They say that gamers who play this put out their own eyes in an effort to erase the memory of what they've seen. They say that seven days after you what? play what it. What happens? Seven days after you play it. What happens? Seven days after you play it, you would dirty the blockbuster and you never get your money back. No. Yes. It's Aquaman. No! This is Aquaman. Doesn't look like Aquaman to me. This is Aquaman. You know, the Luke Skywalker boyishness, the tasteful scaly orange mixed with the industrial green of his gloves. This guy, he's got a blonde mullet and a claw hand. What happened? A horrible disaster at a Skinnerd concert? Now, if you think the fish man looks bad, check out the game. You swim and you fight. Swim more, then fight. That's it, and it still barely works. Reminds me of another famous superhero game, The Abominable Superman 64. Looks like the Man of Steel's got a buddy. Now we all know that Aquaman's superpower is that he can talk to fish. Look what happens when the concentric circles come out of his head in the game. Oh yeah, that's exciting. I'm not going to let some stupid game prevent me from a decent Piscean human discourse. Meet Slippy. He's my new buddy that I took around my hometown. Slippy and me became fast friends. He loved the view. Which is more than I can say for the graphics in Aquaman. The word I like to use is dull. The only effort seems to have been put into Aquaman's golden flowing mullet. And these are what pass for cutscenes. Comic book panels without sound. But you can add your own. Arthur, you must stop him. You cannot allow this man to continue to attack Atlantis or us. He will not of that, you can be sure. Slippy and I had far better conversations. We talked about his life in the ocean and even called some family. As I said before, virtually all you do in Aquaman is fight bad guys. Sometimes to deactivate bombs, and other times to rescue these Tom of Finland rejects. You'd expect then that the combat might be half decent at least. This is the highlight. The controls are mushy and some combos require an absurd amount of memorization. Not that it matters. Just hit some buttons, move on, hit some buttons. There are some sub-levels to break things up. The best way to describe them is imagine something fun, then take away the fun part. Speaking of fun, Slippy and I were having a blast until we went to the wrong part of town. After that, he started to act surly. I think he had too much water. No, no. Aquaman is one of the worst games to come out this year. It has just enough elements to qualify as a game and no more. There is not one interesting aspect of this title to even warrant a rental. Aquaman, the fight for Atlantis, sleeps with the fishes. A one out of five. Oh, and Slippy, well, he made some comment about my hair. I made a comment about deep fat fries and big appetites. Amazing. Such a bad game to make for such a great day. That was horrible. It was the scariest game yet, and I don't know where Adam is. But he seems to have left me some fish and chips. Oh, this is all. It was a joke, Morgan. Ow, well, Morgan. For Chico. <laughs> Morgan, it was a joke. Oh, we don't you. Today on X Play, games that make us pee our pants, like Silent Hill 4. Are these swords overcompensating for anything in Monster Hunter? And did we mention Resident Evil 4? Ah! Oh, oh, 
It's game time! Afraid. Be very, very afraid for Adam Sessler and Morgan oh! Webb. Hello and welcome to this extremely scary episode of X Play. Why are you extremely scary? Well, just look at us. Hey. Well, on today's show, we'll be checking out the biggest horror game of next year, Resident Evil 4. But that's not all. We have Monster Hunter for the PlayStation 2. Forgotten Realms, Demon Stone, a game made by the development team behind the Two Towers. And we have the 10 scariest moments in video game history. Plus, later, we have our review of Silent Hill 4, the game that routinely makes people pee their pants. But we kick things off with an old horror franchise that finally got a much-needed makeover. We voted it Best Game of E3 2004, and after you watch what we have to show you, you'll know why we love to be scared by it. Here's our preview of Resident Evil 4. Need a broom? At x -Play, we like to think that you can't keep a good man down. We like to believe the same about classic game franchises like Resident Evil. For this series, it's do or die time. After playing Resident Evil 4, it's become obvious that this game has plenty of doing. And even more dying. You play as Leon Kennedy. Yep, the same guy who starred in Resident Evil 2. Where's everyone going? Bingo. It's been six years since the tragedy at Raccoon City, and Leon is now a special agent assigned to protect the president's family. This mission has him looking for the president's daughter in the jungle. Yeah, we'll stay and watch that car. Don't want to get any parking tickets. Right. And oh yes, the natives are restless. I am more detrás. Who are these people? Are they zombies? Are they human? Or have they simply watched too much Dr. Phil? Oh, la campana. Es hora de rezar. Tenemos que irnos. One thing we can tell you is that, once again, it looks like some sort of virus is to blame. I'm fine! Just leave me alone! Oh, and this guy. Forget about the old Resident Evil games with their clunky controls and disorienting camera angles. This time, you have the ability to look wherever you want. With crazy savages around every corner, you're gonna need it. And these beings aren't your average brain-dead stumbling corpses, either. They run. Yes, run! They also throw things at you that you can shoot out of the air. They'll even block and evade your shots. Just don't count on them winning next year's spelling bee. Another new feature is the context-sensitive button. Periodically, the A button will appear on screen and allow you to perform some special actions. Some may call this a bailout, but it's actually pretty slick. The environments are littered with traps. You even come across some of God's wondrous creatures. How we love birds, nature's little angel. There, there, Fido. We'll help you out of that nasty bear trap. Even in this short demo, we're treated to an impressive arsenal. The shotgun is deadly. The hand grenades make villagers go boom! Boom. Boom! Boom! The machine gun will keep the Cretans at bay, and the rocket launcher, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. Some of the Resident Evil staples have returned, including the inventory screen, save points, and those lovable green herbs. And most importantly, fights with huge creatures that defy description. If all the levels in Resident Evil 4 are as good as the one we played, look out. From what we can tell, the only downer is that we'll have to wait until early next year to play it. And we can't wait for this game to come out. The sooner the better, Capcom. Please. Um, oh, but Morgan, yeah. are you supposed to be Bastila? <laughs> no, Bastila has a double-sided yellow lightsaber. Mine is purple, and there's only one Jedi with a purple lightsaber. Okay, then please do not tell me you're supposed to be Mace Windu. <laughs> 
Um, of course not. I'm Mace Windu's ex-wife. I got his lightsaber in the divorce. See, it says bad mother. Okay, anyway, we're going to go on to our next game. It's Capcom's online creature killer, Monster Hunter. Here's our review. No. Wouldn't it be grand to go to a world where humans and dinosaurs could live in perfect harmony without bloodshed? Yes, it would. But that is not the type of symbiosis a player will experience in the huge world of Monster Hunter for the PS2. The goal, stay alive, make monsters dead. First up, it's time to create a character. Yeah. Then you're plopped into your home village where you can get your first quests. You'll learn the ways of hunting yeah. and carving and cooking. That's right, cooking. You'll also learn how to collect wild plants such as herbs and mushrooms and how to combine them to potions. You'll also discover that you can collect valuable monster parts and even mine certain metals to create or improve your weapons. And I bet you never would have guessed that you could fish too. Though there are some opportunities for stealth, the action is mostly hack and slash. And have some more. The right analog stick controls your weapon, which is kind of cool, but the camera is not auto-centering and there's no lock-on. So you either have to use L1 to reset it or the D-pad to control it manually. That's a pain. You can play the game entirely offline until the wild boars come home, but you'd be missing out on a huge part of the Monster Hunter experience, taking the hunt online. The only hitch is getting set up for online play is very tedious. Another royal pain. Which is better and easier to use? USB headset to talk to your buddies or an on-screen alphabet to click through. But when you're done, you can meet up with up to two other players in the town tavern and then go and quest it. Since liquor and killing go hand in hand, you can kill some time by getting trashed on some good old ale. Monster Hunter looks great. The stunning vistas and the detail in the environments immerse the player into the untamed wilderness. The soundtrack is similarly atmospheric with music playing only in civilized areas or during certain events like cooking food. Bottom line is Monster Hunter is an excellent game, but it isn't for everyone. Problems with the camera and controls hold it back from being heralded as one of the best, and unless you have the broadband adapter, you're missing out on a large chunk of the hunting experience. With that said, there's definitely enough here for serious players to enjoy if they're willing to devote the time necessary to really dive into the game. The pros outweigh the cons in this one, so we give Monster Hunter a decisive four out of five. Don't run away, no, don't. please. No. When we come back, we have even more scary stuff. Like Adam trying to be stealthy. Hey, come on. It was bad. Next, X-Play presents the scariest moments in gaming. Yes, it's another crappy Halloween show with Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Yay! Yeah. Welcome back to this frightful edition of X-Play. We return with Morgan's top 10 scariest moments in video game history. Yes, I alone have compiled this list of the doomed, the damned, and the totally freaky. Behold... There's a lot of scary video games out there. Apparently, people like the crap scared out of them. Personally, I don't, but that's just me. I mean, don't get me wrong. Little pixelated aggravation never hurt anybody. But the creepy, give you nightmares, lurching, zombie crying baby kind of games really freak me out. But for you guys, I bring you the top 10 scariest moments in video game history. <laughs> Number 10 is from Clock Tower. The Clock Tower murders are fascinating research material for me. Okay, so the voice acting is laughable. Sounds crazy, but it looks like they were killed with a giant pair of scissors. And that's even funnier. But you were scared when Scissor Man was chasing you around and you emotionlessly and slowly walked away from his lurching attacks. You were scared. Admit it. Oh, the suffering. As if prison weren't scary enough, there's this. No! Oh, and this. Yeah. Mmm, those goddamn half-naked twins in Fatal Frame. Twins are always really scary, though. So it's not much of a surprise. Dancing Warlords. 
Sure, you all love it when there are naked chicks in video games, but you all start screaming like little babies when the guys get all naked and jiggy. Yoo-hoo, sexy man over here. Oh, he's naked and fearless. Chicks love that. Silent Hill is always good for a scare. <laughs> What's this? <sighs> Duh, it's a rotting corpse on a hospital gurney. And you come in here to this chain link maze, and this wasn't here a minute ago. And... What is this? What's going on here? What's going on is that your voice acting is kind of killing the mood. But this wasn't here a minute ago, and all of a sudden these little dog people are trying to drink out of your hose, and the crap camera angles make it so you can't see anything. I hate these games. The worst part is that damn radio. Whenever I hear the sound of that radio, I freak. Bummer. Pterodactyl is eating my head. Hey, mister! Wanna play with me? And kids always freak me out. Hey, mister! You wanna wrestle? Doom was scary. Now, for all you youngsters out there, I know you don't believe me, but in the olden days, this stuff really scared people. I mean, they were Hell's minions. Hell's pixelated minions. Scary! Now, the number one scariest moment in video game history. The day you discover the trans vibrator in Res. At first, you think it's pretty cool. Ooh, it vibrates to the beat. Then you discover it has a washable cover. Washable cover? Ew! Ew! Um, did you notice that most of your games weren't actually scary? I told you I'm not really into scary games because they kind of scare me, actually. Then why did you do something called Let's Play Talk on Scary Games? Because I wanted to do something for the Halloween show. Okay, and why were there only nine? I don't know, I got distracted. Distracted by what? Ten? Coming up, the simple joys of Forgotten Realms Demon Stone. I could do that all day. Once again, two people dressed like dorks. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Uh, clearly there's only one person dressed like a dork here. Oh, oh yeah, right, right, laugh it up, Augie Webb doggy. Yeah. Anyway, we're back with a game written by fantasy legend R.A. Salvatore. Who is that? Here's our review of Forgotten Realms Demon Stone. Ah, life as a nomadic fighter in the Forgotten Realms. A Triple H hairstyle, a peaceful walk in the woods, a red dragon roaring overhead. The simple life. Forgotten Realms Demon Stone brings the D&D world made famous in Baldur's Gate into a realm light on the dice and heavy on the three hit combos. Rannick the fighter here is only one of the three heroes at your disposal. There's also Zai, the mouthy half-drow rogue. That's dark elf to you non-nerds. She can turn invisible and insta-kill people from behind. I could do that all day. And finally, Ilias, the clean-cut sorcerer and your go-to guy for distance attacks. Together, they accidentally unseal a demon stone, unleashing two demons from another plane of existence. If left free, either of them will annihilate Faerun. Annihilation is bad, so the three companions will have to retrap the rampaging outworlders in a new demon stone before they kill everyone in their path. Oh, look what you did to the poor wood elf village. I thought she hated wood elves. Lies. Some of my best friends are wood elves. All three heroes are active simultaneously. You switch between them at will, whenever you need their specific strengths. Each level is beautiful to look at and feels unique, and often features gadgets and weaponry you can play with. Ooh, catapults. Between levels, you can upgrade the team with new attacks, spells, armors, and weapons. It's always nice to be able to dish out or take more damage, but most of the combo attacks and new moves are fairly useless. Rarely is anything more effective than that old standby, the hammer the X button until everything around you is dead technique. Of course, if you get good at backstabbing with Jai, entire armies of Slad will fall dead before they even know what hit them. My whole life, nobody turned their backs for a second. Smart elves. The game is balanced, so you can play all three characters at will, but that can also make it bland at times. What would have broken up this monotony? How about multiplayer? It seems like a no-brainer, but Demon Stone is a solo adventure only. Even worse, your allies are often unhelpful to the point of seeming apathetic. 
Hi, only character who can hit the dragon here. Could use some help with the legions of slaver and beasts at my heels. Yeah, did I mention you can't even give orders to your allies without draining your super bar? The production values are sky high, especially the voice work by the likes of Michael Clark Duncan and Patrick Stewart. I've dreamed about this day for a hundred years. I'm flattered that I held your interest. There's even some fan service in the form of a level set at Mithril Hall that lets you play as the legendary Drist Dwarden. But once you're done with the short quest, you've already played all three roles in the story. And wow, no multiplayer is disappointing. It hurts my heart. Forgotten Realms Demon Stone sports spectacular battle scenes and a beautiful representation of the land of Faerun. But you're not likely to remember it long after the credits roll. A three out of five. Don't go away. Yes, yeah, there's more hor horror when we return. Up next, creeping you out since 1999, it's Silent Hill 4. I peed my pants because of Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Sorry about that. Welcome back to this Halloween-y edition of X-Play. Adam? Adam? We've come to last do the last and scariest game of the show. Silent Hill 4. Yes, the only franchise built on the opening credits of 7. It's back. Here's our review. Barely a year after the third installment wrapped up that whole demon worshipping coven thing, Konami blesses us with another grueling tale of horror. Silent Hill 4, The Room. A few days ago, Henry Townsend found he couldn't leave his apartment. He can look out the window and see the outside world, but the front door is chained up like it has a thing for bondage. What the hell? What's going on here? As if that weren't enough, forces from beyond keep crank calling him. Hello? Help me. What? After finding a mysterious hole in his bathroom, he crawls into it and ends up in an alternate reality that bears a striking resemblance to the titular township. Throughout the game, Henry goes back and forth from the otherworldly outside realm to the increasingly unsettling prison his apartment has become. Naturally, the screwy dark worlds are populated with ugly, unearthly monsters that attack you on sight. They're not really all that scary, although they do their best to gross you out. Oh, yuck. <laughs> oh, will you stop making that noise? <laughs> this is reason enough to beat them to a pulp with a heavy object, but the combat in Silent Hill 4 is sadly deficient. The only scary part here is how difficult it can be to get Henry to fight effectively. There's a new circular meter that you can build up to pull off a power hit, but it all looks and feels clunky, not terrifying. Is anyone really creeped out by demon dogs and zombie bats anymore? The dark corridors of Silent Hill still serve up some chills, but the flashlight foo of the previous games is nowhere to be found. So you think this is a dream, huh? Well, if it's not a dream, what is it? Then there are your companions. You spend a lot of time escorting an injured or helpless friend through the bowels of your own personal hell. Since you have no way to control or instruct her, this is mostly an exercise in frustration. Wow, you're not looking so good, lady. The point of it all is to uncover why this is happening to Henry, and the story unfolds with the usual Silent Hill flair. What is it with this series and creepy children? That's what everybody calls me, but I don't really have a name. Silent Hill 4 certainly takes the story in a new direction, but the gameplay is starting to feel a bit stale. And maybe it's me, but flaming ghost monsters seem downright tame next to the truly terrifying moments of my life. Hello and welcome to GameSpot TV. Ah! Oh, oh, what the hell is that? Stop it! Destroy that footage! Oh, thank God. A two-headed baby monster with no legs. Oh, that's so much better. X-Play gives Silent Hill 4 the room a three. Out of five. Ah, I gave my eyes. We shall never speak of this. That is the worst gaming haiku I've ever heard. And who was that? 
No, I'm sneaking away now. Watch, play, win, hyperactive. We have a new online game everyone is talking about. Every weeknight, while you watch X Play and Unscrewed with Martin Sargent, go online and play hyperactive along with the shows. You can win an iPod Mini and other cool stuff. Many of you will be playing for months to come. For rules and details, go to g4techtv.com slash hyperactive and play along with X-Play and Unscrewed every weeknight starting at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. That's it. Lip, lip to the right. Oh! Oops. Ma'am, is Final Fantasy in your used games section? Used games? You really do like fantasy, don't you? Toy stores don't take games seriously. You gotta talk to gamers. Final Fantasy breaks the role-playing mold, and you can save some cash if you buy a pre-owned. Cool. Pre-owned games and equipment at big discounts. Save on new games by trading in old ones. Try them before you buy them. If you're serious about games, talk to the gamers at EB Games. Hi, my name is Laurent Dobas, and I hold the short mode record for the Elysium Alps course on SSX. It took me only nine months to achieve this score. Four friends of mine, also in their 30s, purchased the system and the game so they could play too. When the PS2 came around, my life changed. The first SSX was a revelation for me. Awesome graphics on what video games are supposed to be all about. Once I realized the million points barrier could be broken, I had to keep trying. I had to do it. It was a hot summer afternoon and I was just out of the shower. I turned on my PS2, my VCR, and bang, I hit the million points on my first run. I was shaking like crazy and unable to play after that for a couple of hours. It was pretty insane. Ever wondered what it's really like to be a soldier? What do you got? I have a sip rep from Alpha Company. Your team ready to be verified! Verified! Put yourself in the picture with this free video. You'll see over 200 great jobs in the Army and over 180 in the Army Reserve. You'll also see what skills you learn, how you can earn money for college, even what soldiers do in their free time. Call 1-800-984-ARMY now and get this free t-shirt and your free video. Put yourself in the picture and see what it's really like to become an Army of One. My name is Dave Kramer, and I'm the world record holder for fastest completion of parking challenge number five in 18 Wheeler. It took me months of daily playing to whittle my time down. On my days off, while my wife and son were sleeping, I poured eight plus hours of non-stop gameplay. For some reason, I picked up this game very quickly. I mean, I'm usually pretty good at driving and racing games, 
but there was something about this. I guess it was that it was just unique. My favorite movie is a no-brainer, Star Wars. I'm a huge Star Wars fan and have been ever since I saw episode 4 back in 77. I basically play games because it's kind of an escape. The same reason a lot of people read books and watch movies. The way I explain it best to those who don't like games is this. You watch movies, right? What could possibly be better than watching a movie and getting to be the lead? You can control the outcome. And you can try things in games you never could get away with in real life because it might cause some harm. What is Nintendo up to? We'll talk to some experts about whether or not the Revolution controller will actually be revolutionary. And they've pulled the plug on Ashford's call, too. We're going to talk to the man who did the deed, Jeff Anderson from Turbine, and find out why. And the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Chris Miller is here with exclusive footage of this highly anticipated FPS because G4 TV, the only show with motion-sensitive forced feedback, mm. starts right now. What is that? That's important, isn't it? <laughs> My chair's rumbling. That's right. Hey, That's right. everybody, times. welcome to G4 TV. Now, Laura, I couldn't help but notice how, how large your hands are. Yes, and you know what say uh, women with what? large hands uh, can't no? hold the Game Boy Micro. That's what I was thinking. It's tiny. Because it's so tiny. It Take is. a look at it against the GBA, right? And you can really see the difference. Mm -hmm. Twenty bucks more expensive though. It That's only right. weighs two point eight ounces. Basically plays all the game that the GBA SP does. Over right. seven hundred titles. Graphically, it looks really good. I think it's it cool, does. but for me, it's like you know when you have this and then you have the DS, which is only you know twenty thirty dollars more. It's like you know how right. do you pick between the two? This is a lot less clunky, and it fits in your pocket. Yeah. And uh, but you can't play those great DS, those yeah. innovative DS games. Right, that's truly a problem. There's no stylus with it, but anyway, it's coming <laughs> out mid September. Everyone's kind of looking forward to it. So that's the uh, that's, that's the Game Boy Micro. That's one of Absolutely. the news from Nintendo. That's some of the news. From what Nintendo. else? But what everyone really wants to talk about is the revolution. That's right. And as you guys know, the Tokyo Game Show, which is one of the longest running, most important annual events in gaming is happening right around the corner, September 16th through 18th. And this year, Nintendo's going to make an appearance where in the past years, they usually don't show up. Yep. And in fact, company president Satoru Iwata is going to be one of the keynote but speakers. So basically, heart, everyone's wondering, what the hell is this guy going to say? Because what we want to know, what we want him to say, is what is this new revolution controller? Yes. What's it going to look like? Right. And what's it going to do? We're Tina. dying to know. I'm dying. Everyone dying. wants to know, and there's so much speculation because, you know, yeah. E3, they showed the console, but they said we have to wait on the control. I remember you did that interview with Miyamoto, and he said, you know, we don't want anyone to steal it. That's so what they're very yeah, about Lips it. are tight, man. Exactly. But let's take a look at what they've actually said on the record about the revolution controllers. This is a quote from Mr. Iwata. He said, there are too many buttons and sticks on controllers for novice players. We really want people to feel like they want to touch and play with it. Dirty, so that's kind of dirty. It's interesting. And then he also said it certainly makes a game better to have voice commands because it can alter how the game is played. We may or may not use the microphone in the new Nintendo Revolution well, so interface. The microphone. So, so I don't think it ever works I don't right. know, but like th there's all this sort of speculation, speculation, and, like, no one really knows what they're going to do. But, of course, you know, when we asked Nintendo of America for comment, <laughs> they said Nintendo does not comment on speculation. So, obviously, they haven't so, been talking to Mr. Iwata. Nintendo doesn't comment on Nintendo's <laughs> own press release. All right, well, even though Nintendo isn't giving out much specific info on their new controller, that doesn't stop their legions of fans from taking a stab at what they think Nintendo has up their sleeve. Take a look at some of these mock-ups that we've taken from 4colorrebellion.com. And as you look can at see, that. they are That's all a, over the board. It's got a shovel so we can dig itself. But does it have a microphone? It That's doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> You, I that? like this one because it's got the microphone. It's also it's interesting because a lot of people have been talking about maybe the you know the the, the controls will actually be projected. It could be a touch right. screen I don't think or that's something. Bad. It's I actually cool. don't think it that's looks bad. comfortable at least in yeah. your hands with the rounded corners. I like that one. The win, just win, <laughs> just win. It's simple, like a lot of said. Few <laughs> exactly. buttons. Exactly, not a lot of buttons there. <laughs> oh, I love that. And this one, which we're not really sure, is it remote controlled? What's it doing? This is like something that fell off the space shuttle that now they're just saying is part of the controller. It could be yeah, a chair. I'm not really There's sure. There's lots lot of speculation. One thing people keep talking about is maybe the controller is going to have like a gyroscope or some tilting. I mean, that's the big speculation that might be in there. We'll see. We'll I'm not that excited about the tilting or the microphone, but I like the wind button. And I want it to be wireless too. as long as it's wireless. Yeah, yes. definitely it's got to be wireless. And so, what, you know, what we wanted to do was check in with an expert. In fact, Nintendo expert and IGN Cube editor-in-chief Matt Casamassina to get his take on all this commotion. So, Matt, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. All right. Now, Matt, we just saw some, obviously, you know Nintendo having their fanboy, fanboys. We've got some incredibly detailed, imaginative mock-ups. Uh, you've seen them as well. Do you think any of them maybe are on the right track? I think uh, they're probably, they may have some elements of the right track, but I don't think any of these controllers are accurately going to represent what we're going to get with the final product. Which possible elements are you talking about? Like the microphone, you think that's a short thing? 
I think probably, yeah. Actually, Nintendo itself has said that it was evaluating the idea of using a microphone and that it was, you know, something that it would probably include in there, but it, it wouldn't be a controller-making option. Right. So, Matt, do you think, I mean, there's talk about, you know, gyroscopes, you know, interesting sort of, you know, touch screens, you know, that kind of idea. Where do you think it's actually going to net out? What do you think is true? What's not? Well, I think this is all really wishful thinking, and I think it right. could come true um, just because Nintendo has dabbled in all these technologies. If you look back, um, touchscreens obviously on DS, although it did say that it wouldn't be using a dual screen design for anything on Revolution. Right. And um, we're still talking about just the controller. Yeah. Now, now, Matt, do you think that the Revolution has a chance to be number one against the PS3 and Xbox 360? I think it, actually it does because, you know, it's going for a different market like DS, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, been following the trend with DS versus PSP. Probably, I think most would agree PSP is the better hardware, but right. DS is really outselling it because it's. Well, I heard like Nintendo Dogs has sold. Someone told me it's like it sold 250,000 copies already. Or yeah, something. in the first yeah. week, and it's yeah. just because you know these games are really appealing to a different type of audience, a more mainstream type of audience. Definitely, and, and also it's got to be yeah. backwards compatible. You got to be able to play all the old Nintendo games on. Right. It, so yeah, and they've commented that all these, yeah. you know. It's going to be able to be compatible with every past system. I heard it's going to have a GPS unit, so if someone steals it, you're <laughs> yeah. going to know exactly how to get so it. Yeah, I mean, based on some of these mock-ups, that could uh, very well be true. Yeah. Well, the mock-ups are great. You know, everyone's sort of predicting that they're going to hopefully talk about this at TGS. What are your sources saying? Do you think it, this is where yeah, we're going yeah, to find it? Yeah, it sounds like um, it's, it's going to happen here at TGS. Um, they're definitely going to be talking Revolution, and based, based on people I've talked to, um, the controller is going to come up. Big news. Well, thank awesome. you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. And, uh, Appreciate it. We'll have a report from Jeff from the TGS. Right, well, yes. Yes. Good news right. on the And I'm going to watch from my TGS. living room. Okay, good. Uh, and you guys, I also got a chance to speak with the founder and president of Astro Studios, Brett Lovelady. And these are the guys who designed the controller for the oh, wow. Xbox 360. Oh, wow. cool. And basically what he says is that people, gamers now, are so trained to use the joystick that has this button, this button, an analog stick, and this button, that he doesn't know if Nintendo should stray too far from that concept design right. because gamers may be like, oh, I agree. that's it's weird. Radical. And I don't yeah. know how to play with that that has the buttons the here. controllers or not, I remember with the PS3 controller, everyone saw this weird sort of boomerang thing, and everyone yep. kept saying it's like, that's interesting, but it's like the DualShock for PS2 is so great now, yes. right. we, you don't you, need to change it. It's, it's not it broken. But it does, there's a transition period. But it doesn't stuff. mean it's the best. Yeah. He even mentioned the fact that we use, uh, Brett was so great, he mentioned we use keyboard and mouse, uh, which may not be the best technology, but right. we're so used, used to it. To it. Exactly. Yeah. But he did say that if any company could do it and make us all go this other way, it it's would Nintendo. be Nintendo. Cool. I agree. So there you go. Well, well you know, developer? we also talked to a bunch of developers to see, because, you know, developers are what matter if they're going to make games for this. Absolutely. Yeah. They're going to be excited. And one quote that's been out there on the Internet is Peter Molyneux from Lionhead Studios. And I, I saw Peter a couple of months ago, and he was asking me, to, what did I know about the revolution? Now he gave this quote saying, never underestimate Nintendo. That's all I can say about the he's controller. Right, so he's right. obviously excited. He's, he's a on creative the page guy. with Brett Lovelady. He said, if anybody can do it, Nintendo. That's good. Yeah. And then we also we went to Ted Price <laughs> from Insomniac Studios. This is what he told us. He, I think he was joking, but he said, what's unique about the Revolution controller? This is going to play games for you. Eventually, upgrades <laughs> will include add-on AI modules to do your job and manage your relationships. Ted's such a tech guy. That's he's like a the AI though. module. The guy right. with the win button was on the right track. <laughs> you don't have to do much. But finally, of one course, button. guys, look at this. Look at this photo. you got to love Cliffy B. <laughs> and this is what Cliffy B told us. He said, I'm glad someone's trying to change the paradigm. The last big innovation in controllers was the introduction of the analog stick. Look at that picture. Now, Cliffy, of course, yes. you know, Cliffy wouldn't just we give us a quote. He's we love him. He's close to our hearts. He gives us a world exclusive, his interpretation. Of what he thinks oh, really? the controls do. Yeah. These are mock-ups. Let's take a look. This is a world exclusive. There you go. There you go. Nice, as, as phallic and as... <laughs> um, <laughs> way to go, Cliff. Did he borrow those props Way to go, Cliff. That nice Cliffy's go. quote is, I think Nintendo is finally going to give users the force feedback <laughs> oh, they've been asking wow. for. Oh, I think wow. I'm finally blushing here on G4 That's TV. That's okay. We're on late at night. If your entire world is being taken away from you and you feel like you have nothing left, you're not alone. Up next, we're going to talk to Jeff Anderson from Turbine, the man who took away your world. Don't even think about moving. You either, Jeff. I'm not moving. <laughs> We've got a 1099 in progress. Suspect is approximately 12 feet tall, green skin. All units move in. Perp is on our. Mayday, mayday. The world is your weapon. Rage is your ammunition. And the target is whatever you want to destroy. Quite possibly the best superhero game to date. Ultimate Destruction, rated T for Teen. Nintendo, what's your problem? We don't want to see another Mario sports game. We want to see some M-rated games out there, because M-rated games have better plots and are more fun to play. What the heck's with all the negative put-downs about Advent Rising? I mean, I'm borrowing it from a friend right now, and I played it. Yeah, it's the frame rate. It is horrible, but it has an awesome story plot. Please don't tell me I'm the only one who wants a Mutant League football remake. Especially on the next gen, bones breaking, 
guts flying, count me in. Oh, you might be the only one. We've got a lot of <laughs> angry ge- uh, viewers who want... Sure, right. yeah. he doesn't like all those bad things you're saying about Advent. You weren't a big fan of Advent either. Yeah, either. Yeah, it's, it's like, good it's music. Like, that's yeah, it doesn't actually play smoothly or straight, <laughs> right. or you can't jump, but hell, it's but a good great times. game. Right. Good times. All right, guys, well, welcome back. Now, what do you do when you find out the MMORPG you've invested months of your life in is going to shut down? <gasps> well, this week, thousands of Asheron Call 2 players had to face that very question. Now, the MMO market is growing, with World of Warcraft recently topping 4 million players. Pretty impressive. But a few games are dominating the market, leaving many small MMOs struggling to survive. Well, joining us via satellite today to discuss the state of the business and to explain the closure of Asheron's Call 2 is Jeff Anderson, the CEO of Turbine, the company that created the game. Hey, Jeff. Hi, how are you? Hey, Good. hey Jeff. Thanks, thanks for being on, Jeff. Let's get right to it. Why did you decide to close down Asheron's Call 2? Well, the closure was really based around a simple business decision. We just didn't have enough subscribers coming into the game on a daily basis to make it successful enough for us. How many subscribers did you guys roughly have? Well, we don't talk about numbers. Obviously, what we want to reinforce is the difference between where we are in a game like AC2, which was kind of in the later stages of its development, and a product like Asheron's Call 1, which is still very vibrant and has a huge community. Why do you think the game didn't get the subscribers maybe it deserved? Why did it fail? Well, there's lots of reasons it's possible that it didn't reach the numbers we had hoped for. I think fundamentally it just didn't find its market, it didn't find its audience. Our focus really is on how do we continue to define the business, how do we make better products, and we feel like the next games we're working on really help do that. What's interesting though is that, you know, the first game is surviving here when the second one isn't. So, I mean, that's always an issue. It's like, you know, you create a sequel, you hope all the users are going to kind of transition to the next game. Did that just never happen in this situation? Now, I think, frankly, looking back on it, maybe working on a game like a sequel isn't maybe the smartest thing to be doing. We want to really try to invest in the communities as opposed to trying to do sequels. Expansion packs have proven to be incredible, you know, incredibly successful way of doing that. Now, one of the interesting things is, you know, I always look at the sort of social dynamics of these games. It's interesting, with a game like World of Warcraft, everybody and their friends are playing that game. So that's sort of the game you want to play. Is there ever sort of a worry that, you know, the smaller games you, you can never reach that critical mass because everyone and their friends is playing a different game, so it's hard to attract them to a new property? Well, there is, there is no doubt that there's a, what we call a network effect of right. people who will attract other people to come in and play the game. So if you're there and you have a friend, you want to bring them along, that's definitely true. That's true whether it's a small game or a large game, but the effect is so much greater in a large game. Still, I think long-term we'll see in the business an opportunity for the big games to have big markets and for small games to have audience share as well. Can you imagine, are those games still viable though, you think, with, you know, 50,000 subscribers? I mean, you know, these games cost so much to make these days. I mean, do you have to have, you know, a couple hundred thousand people to make it viable? Great question. It really comes down to what the product is and who the people are that are running it. You can imagine a you know, small boutique, uh, maybe a text-based mud, where the costs of both production and maintenance are really low. They can be very profitable with 10, 20 people playing a game. Let's talk about some new games. You're working on both Dungeons & Dragons Online and Lord of the Rings Online. Online. Are you at all worried about possibly releasing two fantasy MMOs titles so close together? Well, it's the question for us is how do we create the separation between the two products? Dungeon Dragons Online is a terrific product, really focused on what we describe as the dungeon crawl experience. Instead of a lot of landscape sprawl, we're really going for that terrific dungeon crawl. How can I have this party of unique skills and characters and classes built together to make the best use of this terrific instant dungeon? And you look at Lord of the Rings, a terrific franchise, what a great book, what a great film, a, a wonderful intellectual property. And our focus there is how do we create that epic masterpiece that the online player really wants to be a part of? How can they adventure in the world of Middle Earth? How can they be fighting alongside heroes and characters that they've known throughout the, you know, the decades and millennium? And when are we going to have, you know, be able to get in the betas for these games? Soon? Well, you, I don't know. I haven't got my check in the mail yet, but uh, <laughs> most most players are able to start signing up right now on ddo.com and, and the website and Turbine's website, turbine.com. They can go there and put their information in, and we're taking active people today that are being let in. We have you know, upwards of 1,000 people playing in the DDO right now, and it's exciting. to. I go in every night and play, and I see just more and more people showing up. Well, so Jeff, those, are, those are two fantastic licenses and franchises. You know, yeah. We wish you the best of luck with both of them. Thank you, Jeff. Well, all right, if you like having the crap scared out of you, you'll just love what we've got next. We're bringing you fear right after this. Tina likes to have the crap beat out of her. Yeah. Sup dudes, y'all haven't improved my game with the ladies. So I'm treating you in for a Nintendog. He barks when all the girls are around with their Nintendogs, and bam! 
Nintendogs are off the hook. I connect with other dog owners and train my own dog with my voice and touch. Honey, the girls are here. I know, Mom. Play on, play. <laughs> Nintendogs. Only for Nintendo DS. Rated E for everyone. Need a late night snack? Try Barbed Wire Biscuit, a mouthful of mashed up mayhem. What? Blow stuff up and learn about science with Brainiac. Is looking at women's breasts a workout? Get sick and twisted with the happy tree friends and friends. Where's that coming from? And sample the best eye candy from Japan with Anime Unleashed and Cinematech Nocturnal Emissions. Taste the party. Barbed Wire Biscuit. Tonight at midnight. You know, everybody likes a good spooky game, and this October, right in time for Halloween, VU Games is bringing out Fear. It's a first-person shooter for the PC that some describe as the Matrix meets the ring. You can already download a single-player demo on the internet. Let's take a look now at the full game. Well, you know, joining us in the studio to tell us about the game is its executive producer, Chris Miller. Hey, you Chris, doing? how are you? So, I gotta ask you, what's with the freaky girl there? Come on, what, what, everybody likes a freaky little girl. That's, <laughs> That's the whole what I've been saying my whole life. It's all about the But it's interesting that you guys are doing, you know, first person shooter, obviously, but some really interesting story elements to it. What can you tell us about the story? Because you guys are shrouding a lot of this game in secrecy, right? Yeah, You're not talking about anything past the fourth level? True. We are, very, we are keeping the story under wraps. I, I can qu quote Craig in, in that, you know, the best way to ruin a horror, a horror story is to explain it away. So one of the tactics is to keep things very sort of low-key, minimalistic, so that, you know, the anticipation builds and everybody, you know, really sort of looks forward to getting their hands on it. Interesting. There is yeah. a freaky girl. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's, We've that's got one we on know. the set here, that's too. Right. Don't worry exactly. about it. Right. It helps it all. That's it's right. all about it that. Better. Now, Chris, another thing I want to ask you about was first-person shooter, very competitive genre, you know, yeah. Half-Life 2, you know, sort of the most innovative games are in that genre. What are you guys bringing innovation-wise to the genre with this game? I think uh, with any of the first-person shooters that are new to the market, there's a drive to sort of innovate technologically. And obviously with Fear, the focus was on, you know, bringing the graphics engine and the effects system up as well as the AI system. Right. And then to sort of push the storytelling into a new genre as well. Uh, or not, not a new genre, but a new way of, of telling the stories. So that's really been the focus and drive on that. Now you're doing this for the PC, and so there's so few PC games now. The market is down 10 to 15 percent, it seems, already this year. Um, why keep doing these games for the PC and not bring them to the console? Well, I mean, the, the PC is what drives technology forward anyway, and consoles right. tend to be sort of snapshots of that technology. But I think in, in the natural case, the Fear Team is a developer founded in PC technology. Right. And so the natural sort of step to stay there as well as branch out. I won't, you know, allude to any potential Ooh. next things. Mm. But, you know, the, the, but the do, focus but Miles is, is doing, there. I mean, they're doing the game Condemned for Sega, which is a console game. Right, so they're right. obviously, you know, moving in that direction yes, a little bit. Yes, they're thinking of, they're, there's a lot of, you know, forward right. thinking going on. Well, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was the actual sort of action. I mean, it's there, you know, it seems lots of guns, lots of combat. How much sort of puzzle solving is in this game versus straight ahead action? This game was f focused on, fear focuses on action. Okay. So uh, pu there are puzzle elements like in there. Like physics puzzles or anything like yeah, that? Or not, not so really? much physics puzzles, okay. puzzles, but sort of movement puzzles and, and interactive object puzzles. But um, again, the focus was on action and to really sort of force the player to, to not be able to think of anything else but, oh man, I gotta get out of this thing alive. Yeah. And then, you know, so so that's where the game really sort of plays up its strengths. Well, it looks great. Now, I know yeah. you guys have been looking at it. Yeah, we have. We boards. actually got a couple messages, a couple <coughs> questions from the boards. Uh, one person wants to know, 
you know, it's all fine and good to play with yourself, but what can we expect from Fierce Multiplayer? Right, mul the Fierce Multiplayer is, is basically a system that's broken down. You've got two teams. It's sort of Counter-Strike-esque in its, in its feel. You've got the two teams. You have uh, the, the slow-motion deathmatch as well as standard deathmatch. It's a, it's, a, it's a really robust system. Mm -hmm. Can you play a the little girl in No, you cannot. <laughs> yeah, can you kill the little girl? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and I'm a little worried. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, Chris, cool. uh, what's the director's edition going to include on the DVD? What are we going to get uh, from that? The director's edition, uh, other than being on DVD versus CD, has the prequel, has a uh, live-action prequel thing that was written by the okay. team and produced. We have a, it's got uh, some bonus content in terms of a commentary pass by a lot of the level designers, Craig, the lead story designer, and and John Mulkey sit down and talk about all like the, what inspired them. A to little get behind into the scenes look yeah, at the making of the game. Cool, the very scenes. cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to play it. It's coming out in October. Sweet. It's fair. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Thanks, thank Chris. You. We appreciate thank it. You. All right, coming up, things get dramatic with our very first version of Message Board Theater. But before that, let's take a look at Spooey's five favorite games in this week's Sweetest Five, presented by Juicy Fruit. At number five, we have Castlevania Symphony of the Night on the PSX. Number four, Resident Evil 4 on the GameCube. Number three, Mega Man 2 on the NES. Number two, Super Metroid on the SNES. And at number one, the Bionic Commando on the NES. Going old school. I like the snips. For $99.99, you can get this Nintendo GameCube along with the best-selling Super Smash Bros. Melee game for free. I just love smacking that Princess Peach. <laughs> Rated teen. Check this out. This is what we do for a living. We're video game designers. And we're game programmers. With the training offered at Collins College, you can learn to design, code, and test games like this. And this. Game design is a growing career. For a brochure on a career in game design, call Collins College at 1-888-256-1200 now. That's 1-888-256-1200. Call Collins College now. Coming up on Formula D. Formula D round five slams into Chicago Soldier Field. We are getting sideways in the Windy City. Can Sammy Burnett smoke points leader Reese Millen for the lead? Or will the future Ken Gushi drift in for the win? Coming up on Formula D next. On the next attack of the show, Major League Gaming co-founder Sundance to Giovanni. Plus, we invade the Las Vegas Star Trek convention and a very body conscious DV Tuesday. It's attack of the show, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Welcome back. Now, earlier we spoke with Jeff Anderson from Turbine, and the news that Ashen Call 2 was closing down came as a pretty big shock to a lot of gamers this week. Nowhere was that more evident than on the official AC2 message boards. We gathered some of those posts and put together this film. All of these are actual quotes from those posts. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you Message Board Theater. For me, it's like a family member has been diagnosed with incurable cancer and has been given four months to live. I will never ever give the people that causes me this pain money again. I have met so many people, many of whom will continue as lifelong friends. We will gather together on our website and our monarch will lead us in choosing of a new game so that we could continue the journey of friendship. The single stipulation would be that it would not be a product of Turbine. I pulled my heart and soul into trying to help this game help its community, and you back out that f***ing fast! Seven f***ing months! Thanks a bunch! You've got to be f***ing kidding me! Thanks a lot! I pulled my heart and soul into trying to help this game, to help its community, and you back out that f***ing fast! Seven f***ing months! Thanks a lot! Wow. I'm honestly stunned. I love this game. I spent a lot of time and effort making it a better place. I'll be very sad to see it go, and I will miss my friends very much.
I don't bother with RLs since I don't see a point in investing time and effort in something that's going to end, most likely in 50 to 100 years. If you're extraordinarily lucky, which I'm not. And that's what's exactly happened with AC2. I always thought naively that AC2 would go on forever. Whoa! There you go. A short film by Guy Brown. Wow, that was. Thank you. Um, I'm upset and might shed a tear. I think our show is a little dramatic. That's right. <laughs> That but people feel passionate. They're affected, taking their lives Tina. away. God, that was great. It was good. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We want to thank our guests, Chris Miller and Jeff Anderson. Now, we're off next week for Labor Day, but we'll see you back here in two weeks with a special report on the Tokyo Game Show. We also want to send out our thoughts to anyone that was affected by Hurricane Katrina. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you.